So, um, everything's fine? Everything is fine. Well, you seem to fit in well here, uh, but you don't have any close friends yet, do you? Are the kids nice to you here? Yeah, why wouldn't they be? Well, you already have some good friends, don't you? Tell me about Cece and Barry. Yeah? Oh, some of the teachers just heard you talking to them. But we don't seem to have any students named Cece or Barry. They're from the story that I'm writing. A story? They're friends in the story? Yep. It's like a time-travelling adventure story. Enough! That's it. I'm out. And Cece and Barry are my travelling companions. I'll see you guys at the Sphinx. They're imaginary friends. But they're not very helpful. Real nice, Cece. I thought you were here to help me. And where are you going, Barry? Uh, I'm gonna go find a car. A car? It's 2000 BC. There are no cars. Train. <laughs> it's not like I need them, though. I can manage just fine without them. Why do you think your friends are here in the story? They were around when I was younger, but I... I don't need them anymore. So what's changed? The day that they appeared, I found the book and kind of sucked us in. I can't really explain it, but we ended up travelling back in time. And the book started telling us what to do. Please listen to me. If the city is to grow, then the railroads must move underground. Tell me, where would the steam go? The idea is absurd, sir. Like something was going to change history, and we had to stop it. There is no steam. There's none, and that's Hello. why... Hello! <laughs> you can see me, and I can see you. Oh. But for some reason, Cece and Barry could be seen. It turns yes. out when we go oh. to the past, they are no longer imaginary. Claire, is he the one? Is he the one that we're meant to fix? Look at those dresses. I'm off. They couldn't handle the attention. So I had to lay down some ground rules. First rule, don't interfere with my life. No, she wouldn't say that. <laughs> Second rule, we don't change history. As time writers, our job is to make sure things happen as they should. I just don't think you should get on that ship. It's going to sink. And third rule, never tell anyone you're from the future. Trust us, we're from the future. Fascinating, a time-travelling encyclopedia. I didn't say encyclopedia. Well, I assumed. Tales of history in a book? What a wonderful outlet. A whole other world for you to explore and work through your emotions in. So you don't think all of this is great? <laughs> My darling girl, of course not. You have a gifted imagination? I want to hear more. How about we chat same time next week? Sure. Don't forget, my door's always open. If you come near Claire again, I'll fart in your face. <laughs> he 
everyone! Have you been exploring the new features in Unreal Engine 5 Early Access? Then make sure to update your experience with our latest hotfix, which includes a variety of fixes to the initial release. Head over to the forums to check out the full list of changes, and then download Unreal Engine 5 Early Access 2 from the Epic Games Launcher or GitHub. Also available on the launcher and GitHub is Preview 2 for Unreal Engine 427, the perfect opportunity to try out even more upcoming Unreal Engine features. 427 includes updated virtual production workflows and architectural pipelines, production-ready pixel streaming, and more. A complete list of changes for 427 can be found on the Unreal Engine 427 Preview Forum thread. We're excited to share two new free services now available from Epic Online Services. First, supercharge your game's community engagement with Voice, our cross-platform in-game voice chat solution. Then, protect your players from cheaters with Easy Anti-Cheat, the industry-leading anti-cheat solution. Dive into the details on these powerful free services on the feed. Unreal Build Broadcast and Live Events 2021 may be over, but you can now watch the sessions on demand. Explore the role of real-time for musical artists with Dead Mouse, how Fox Sports uses virtual sets and AR to tell a better story, and the developments from other innovators in the space including the Weather Channel, Moment Factory, and more. All on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel. With the demand for real-time skills in the job market growing 600% faster than the norm, we've put together a couple of handy resources for educators who are currently or planning to teach Unreal Engine. Explore the basics of Unreal and virtual production with two syllabuses that are already being used in universities, alongside practical assignments that are ready to go. Pop over to the feed to snag them both. Taking cutting-edge graphics to the next level in Guilty Gear Strive, veteran fighting game developer Arc System Works details how it creates and balances its diverse cast of characters while carving out the series' new visual identity. Jump over to our interview to get the full details. Now over to this week's top karma earners, many thanks to Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Lizard89, Vice Versa, CTN Dev, Sayuj JS, Death Ray, Detach789, Island Playa, and Mahokyo. Get the band back together in our first spotlight, Battle Bands, a deck building card game set in Rift City. Rock your way to the top in real time tourneys or challenge offbeat bosses in a co op campaign with sick compositions from Fat Bard. Wishlist Airy Digital's Battle Bands on Steam. Ease the animation process with a little help from Faceware Studio, a production quality facial tracking tool. They're offering a six month free trial, which includes the Glassbox Live Client for Unreal and readily supports meta human characters. Visit facewaretech.com and try out Faceware Studio Personal Learning Edition for free with the code METAHUMAN. And lastly, we'll leave you with A Mother's Kiss by Zach Dembinski. Sculpting over a model from Render People in ZBrush, Zach took the Geo up to 30 million polygons before popping it into UE5 Early Access to explore Lumen and Nanite. Let them know what you think of this beautiful scene over in the forums. Thanks for watching this week's news and Community Spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and please let me introduce once again, Chance Ivy, co-hosting the show here. Hey everyone, good to see you again. Uh, today we're going to talk about motion warping and full body IK, and to help us with this, we have the team behind the tools. Let me introduce Aaron Cox, lead programmer. Hey everyone. Uh, Kieran Ritchie, senior animation programmer. Hello. And once again on the show, I'd like to welcome back Jeremiah Grant, Technical Product Manager. Hey, good to be back. It's good to have you all. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's really exciting to see a lot of the new runtime features um, showing up for uh, runtime animation features showing up in Unreal Engine 5. And I think uh, I'm really excited to get you know all these folks on the call today. Uh, so Jeremiah, you want to give us a little uh, introduction as to where we're going to take things? Yeah, definitely. So we're going to be talking uh, about motion warping and full body IK and how we use them in the Valley of the Ancient project. Uh, just to give everyone a quick agenda of what we're going to talk about. Uh, Aaron is going to give us an introduction to what motion warping is. 
and uh, how you can visualize it and use it in uh, UE5 Early Access. And then we're going to show you a couple examples uh, from the project and go through uh, how we implemented them. Uh, then we're going to pass it over to Kieran, and he's going to talk about Full Body IK. Uh, he's going to give you again an introduction to what it is and uh, and when to use it, and then we'll take a look at again how we're using it in the uh, Valley of the Ancient project. So uh, really looking forward to this one. We've been working really hard on this, both on the tech side and the project. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff to talk through. So with that, let's just pass it over to Aaron. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um... So yeah, I, I wanted to start by giving a shout out to uh, Jaron Peterson and Fernando Castillo Coelho, um, two of the devs who worked on this tech. Um, and I also want to begin by saying uh, this stuff's experimental. We thought it got to a good enough point that we could put it in the Valley of the Ancient demo, and we were excited to to share it. But uh, there's going to be bugs. There's going to be some issues. Um, and uh, yeah, it's still in development. But uh, to get started here, I've made this little holodeck level uh, with a few examples. It's just using the same animations from the Valley of the Ancients demo. Um, so the, the two big places where we use motion warping for the demo, uh, one of them was the portal touch, where Echo reaches out, touches the portal, um, and then we transition into Dark World. Uh, the other case was the vault example, which is a bit more of an elaborate example. And an, I'll, I'll go through both of those. but. Just to uh, motivate things here, I'm going to launch into uh, my map. And uh, I basically got this map where I can hit spacebar, and it'll play the animation, and then I can reset the characters. Um, and uh, here, if I if I press space, this is just playing the animation here. So we're not seeing any motion warping yet. We're just playing an animation. Um, normally, Echo would be uh, reaching out to touch a portal. Uh, instead, I've got this little bird with a big beak. Um, so we, we should have shipped a bird in the demo. That's yeah, I don't know why cooler. you guys didn't use my art. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, nobody ever uses my art. But uh, to kind of just to motivate this concept of motion warping, I just want to show what things look like without motion warping. Um, so, you know, it's nice when the player aligns themselves perfectly for the animation you have so that like the character actually makes contact. Um, but that's not very likely. A player is likely to be like offset um by some amount and so if you just play the montage as authored uh, which i'll do here um she just plays the animation she doesn't make any contact um this is kind of like the the core premise of motion warping is what we have this motion from an animation uh and we want to adjust that motion so that we can actually make contact um with the world or with some other character um so i'm going to flip the camera over here and uh, have a look at this character who's actually had um, motion warping uh, set up. So if I do a little uh, adjustment to her starting point here, um, and you can imagine this being a player coming up or an AI character just approaching something and not being perfectly aligned. When I play this now, she's going to come up, and she ends up perfectly aligned with the object. Um, and here, yes, it's my beautiful portal. This could be something like opening a door, picking an item up from the world. Um, melee attacks are a great use case for motion warping, like a melee system where you've got animations authored um, with different striking ranges, but you want to make sure you hit your target. Um, you can use motion warping to make sure that happens. Trying to get those uh, consistent results every time uh, without having to think about getting a player specifically into a right position and a right locate a right rotation every time. Yeah, and if you you know if you're throwing a punch or you're trying to boop someone on the forehead, you want to make sure you boop their forehead. You don't want to just boop the air. Um, and so um, I wanted to just show the setup for this. Um, if I if I look at my uh, character, I've set up for this test. Um, I'll make this a little bigger. This is just a character like you pretty used to. We've got a capsule and a mesh and a movement component. Uh, the one new thing here is I've gone in and added a motion warping component. Um, I didn't have to do any setup. I just added it. Um, it's here to be able to um, take that data of where you want the character to be from the game and pass that over to the animation uh, so the animation knows uh, how to warp. Next up is uh, I've got my montage. And I'm actually, for this demo, just using 
the montage that you'll find in the demo. Um, so this reach out montage with root motion. Um, and so, oops, don't want to mess with that. <clears throat> so this animation um, just echo steps forward, touches it, and then goes into this idle. Um, the two new things here are our warping windows. Uh, so these are just animation notifies. And the reason why there is two is that we want to rotate the character to uh, face the portal. You can see here, um, we've got a sync point named facing rotation and it's set up to do rotation. Uh, and we want to do that at a different time during the animation than um, when we want to warp the translation. So here we have a location. Uh, and this is really up to the user, like animator or designer would make this choice. You could just have one, like you can see here, I could just check rotation on and have one window for both. But um, based on your circumstance, you, um, you'll you often want to have control over those with two different windows. Mm -hmm. um, so the last little piece here is um, my character. So if I pop back here, um, I guess I already had this open. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I actually. Uh, set this stuff up in my level blueprint just as a test. But you'd often have like a gameplay ability or your character blueprint picking your warp points and making these decisions. Um, I just wanted control over everything from one place. So I did everything in my uh, my level blueprint here. Um, but what we see here, just your average uh, animation montage call. So we're playing that reach out montage, um, nothing new there. The new stuff comes in with this uh, adder update sync point call. Um, this is getting called on that motion warping component that we looked at before. Um, and you can see here, like, there's two of these, and they correspond to the two windows we had in the animation. So there's character location, um, and there's character location. Mm -hmm. And for um, the location that we want to warp to, uh, that's up to the game to decide. You know, like, if you have a door, you the game knows the location of the door that the game wants to interact with. If you're doing a vault, the game's looking at the world in some way to find where is an object to vault. Um, so this is our mechanism. Like the game knows this information. This is how we pass it over to the animation system. Yeah, and I think for for this one specifically, Aaron, when we were setting this up, like what we did is we had the rift set up in the scene, and I put like a little red arrow on the ground that had rotation and location of our character. I placed. Uh, echo in that blueprint for a short bit, scrub to that part of the animation where her hand was reaching out, and then align that arrow with her feet. So we got good data of exactly where we wanted her to be and how we wanted her to be oriented. And we used those to drive those two points. And like I can actually do that here with the with the birdie. Um, if I reset echo there, I can I can click this. I can see where this thing is facing. Um, you know, the red arrow here is where Echo is going to end up facing, and you have uh, fine control of that in the scene of where you want your character to end up. Um, and so, um, the last thing I wanted to to mention here is um, for this case. Um, what we're doing is we're warping the root motion of the character. So the animation's been authored to move, um, you know, the root's going to be down between the feet. Um, we've authored the animation to move a certain amount, and it's that motion we're warping. Uh, so when the character's moving, we, we kind of stretch out how much it's moving, or we warp it to face the direction we want. Um, and a, uh, a point I wanted to make there is I'll just let this play out, and we can see she lands there. Um, what we're actually um, feeding this system right now is the root location. We're not feeding the location where we want her hand. Um, and that's a little bit cumbersome to set up. Um, I've actually in here, I'm, I'm just taking, um, like this is the actor um, that you see there. But I'm actually taking that and doing a bit of math in here um, to calculate an offset so that I, like based on where the hand, like the object is, where should the root be? Um, and that's cumbersome. And we've already fixed that. So if you're looking at like our our main GitHub um, or when you know um, the next version of the engine comes out, uh, you'll see a thing called Warp Point Anim Provider, and that actually lets you just say, "I want the hand to be here," and we'll do the math for you to figure out where the root should be. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, um, yeah that's another uh, nice addition from Fernando to make this stuff easier. 
So uh, even what you did there with that math is a step better than what I did in the project, which was using something from the world to get her location to. I, I did some kind of um, like st it's more static, right? Where uh, I had to tweak that enough times to get it to be exactly what we wanted. Whereas you're doing in this example, just calculation based on locations, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so once we have, you know, you have things like a door and that door mesh has a socket, you can just say warp to this socket and have this bone on the character reach that. And oh, that's awesome. Uh, that'll just, it'll just take care of it for you. So I'm really excited to have that. We just don't have it here to show. Um, next thing I really want to point out is this is not a silver bullet. Um, it, we can't just warp anything. And um, some things are better to warp than others. Uh, so if you watch Echo's feet here, um, as she's walking, you can see they slide a lot. Um, and if you play the portal, um, like the portal section of the demo, um, Chance was nice to us on the animation team and tried to get the camera <laughs> to look away from uh, the feet. Um, but if you if you force the camera and you walk at an odd angle, you are going to see the feet slide. Um, and yeah, especially if you um, come up just to the side of it and then try and warp right. sideways. Yeah, and like, I mean, like, what are you going to do? You've got an animation authored to um, go forwards, and now we're trying to go sideways, and you know, it, it's just not going to look appropriate. What's worse is if you're in the interaction range and you're in front of it. And she moonwalks back to it. Those are some of the some worse? of the best. Yeah, that's <laughs> good skills. Some of those were the the best things to do. So it's kind of a combination of putting some blocking volumes up, camera location to kind of set it up to where, you know, we always got the results that we wanted, but we're kind of keeping we're kind of controlling that environment a little bit more. Yeah, and you know, like you can expand that by having more animation coverage. Like if you had an animation of Echo walking back. Um, uh, a lot of games in these scenarios will actually have a character like locomote to a reasonable location. So you kind of have the AI take over and pathfind your player um, so that you can get like the natural locomotion of strafing. Um, mm. And there are procedural things we can do um, to to keep the feet more stable in these circumstances. But uh, we uh, we got a lot out of um, just the simple technique that we used for the the portal demo. Yeah, what's what's funny too is Aaron, when you and I had hopped on a call, I think with Jeremiah um, and Fernando. Is it Fernando? Um, yeah, it was Fernando. Yeah, and we, uh, I had everything set up to be functional, wholly the same way using blueprints. So I was using blueprints to drive her location over time, right? And we're able to move yeah. all of that, all of that out straight into the animation system. So the actual gameplay logic itself is not trying to handle some, you know. Yeah, root motion related animation things. Uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, you get advantages of you know you just tag your animation and you have control over when in the animation this this happens. Um, and it'll also only warp when the character is actually moving. So if you had some animation with some idle and then it starts moving, we're just warping the motion from the animation. Whereas if you try to like do just an interpolation in the blueprint, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be sliding even during your idle. <laughs> So there's you'd be, a lot of nice workflow benefits here. Responding from Anim notifies to say stop this movement and then <laughs> just pick it back up. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I wanted to hop over to the um, the vault demo now that I've set up. Um, and this is again using the same animation from um, the Valley of the Ancients demo. Um, and I won't belabor this point too much, but this is just the character um, playing the animation as authored. Um, so we run into some problems here where, say, I have a uh, taller object that I want to vault through, uh, vault over. If I trigger this right now, I just like face plant into it. I don't even clear the obstacle. Um, and I can get similar problems where if you know like it's too long um, of an obstacle, so if I put it out like that, um, and you can imagine if you had like this, this animation has like a nice jump, um, so it doesn't look too crazy. But if you had like a standard um, vault animation where the character sort of stays with their hand planted and slides along the object, um, this kind of thing can look really weird where she's not even going to clear the obstacle. Like she just gets stuck. And you also saw there that the obstacle is too low, so um, mm. she's not making contact with it. Um, and there's more problems too, like if, if she's not facing correctly, um, 
like if she's not facing the right way here, we're just playing an animation. So she's just going to go, you know, jump off into the into the sunset and not interact with the object at all. Um, so this um, setup here uh, is a little bit more complicated than the single interaction point setup we had before, um, but it's not too bad. Um, for my example, I've set up this um, object and I've annotated where the interaction points are on it. So I've got a front face, um, a front edge, I should say, where I want her to rotate to align with the object um, and reach that point. So I basically want her hand on this point once um, she's starting to uh, touch the object. And then I have another window to make sure that she can clear the obstacle and then finally a landing point. And you can imagine different scenarios where maybe there's a pit here, so the landing point needs to be lower, or you would have like some raised object and you could use the animation to actually leap up onto something um, by just moving these <laughs> these uh, targets. And I've just done this manually. Um, I'm sure some games are still out there having their poor uh, designers or artists manually take things. Um, I know a lot of games will um, do some build time process to calculate these annotations, or a lot of games will even do this at runtime. Um, but again, that's sort of a, that part's up to the game to figure out, like, the game already needs to know that you, it wants to do a vault. Um, but once it knows that, it can feed the animation system information um, about how to um, warp the animation to match the world. So I'll pop open the montage. <clears throat> and it's pretty similar to what we saw before. Um, now there's three warping windows. Um, and each of these corresponds to um, one of those sync points I was showing. So we've got like the back, um, uh, sorry, the floor, the back edge, and then um, the front edge. And you can see here, like when we're first aligning with the object, we want to do a rotation and a translation. So we want to get up to the obstacle, um, but we also want to rotate. So we're aligned with it. Um, and then, you know, the the other two are just doing translation warping. Um, and once again, uh, in the uh, in the vault demo here, we've just got a montage playing and then um, three of these calls to feed each one of the uh, sync points to the animation system. Right. And and the animation montage that you just showed with the notifies there for it. Uh, answer a question I've seen come up a couple times is can you have more than one track per location and rotation as far as um, what's going to drive, you know, the root motion? And so here you've got one, two, three, four, uh, just five. Just three warping. Just three. Oh, it's just three warping. Yeah. yeah, I see them. Okay. Small on my screen. Um, I mean, I haven't done a lot of testing with them overlapping. Like, if you mean, like, can I have a window that rotates and one that just translates? You can certainly do that. Um, yeah. having multiple that are trying to translate to different points, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not really clear what you would expect to have happen if you're trying to get a character to go to two different points. Maybe the character splits in half. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, depends, it depends on the game, right? Yeah, it depends on your game. It depends on yeah. your game. Um, but um, before I start showing uh, me messing around with this obstacle, I wanted to point out we have uh, some debug commands that you can play around with. If you just type a dot motion warping, um, you'll find this a debug command. I'm going to set to three, so it's very verbose. And I'm also going to uh, bring up this debug lifetime. This the the first command I just ran is going to draw things, and this can uh, control how long they draw for. So I'm just going to set it for 10 seconds right now. Um, and right now, if I play the animation, she's just going to vault over. Um, but if I take, um, sorry, I want to get this object specifically. So if I take this target, for example, and I move it out, um, when I play this now, she's going to she's going to vault over the obstacle, but she's actually going to land here instead of back here. And so there she lands it. Um, and what the debug draw is showing you is the red is where the animation would have taken you, and the blue is where the animation was warped to take you. Um, I'll explain the green in uh, in a minute here. Um, but I just wanted to point out, like, if you actually had these manual annotations or if you were doing traces in the world, if there was some, like, ledge where she just landed, she would actually warp to land up on the ledge instead of going down to the ground. Um, 
And if anyone was paying attention there, you'll actually see this looks kind of weird. Just like wait for her to be in the air. She goes up in the air and then kind of goes and gets sucked down. Um, I've just misplaced my notify. Um, so I can come here and say like, okay, I'm not happy with this warping window when she's going to the floor because she kind of like pops up. Um, she hops up here and then it's not until she's sort of at her apex that I start sucking her down to the floor. And that's why we saw that weird discontinuity in the speed. Um, so a little trick that Fernando added in uh, UE5 that I, I think is really exciting. You can see there's a little message at the bottom there that if you hold shift, like here I'm dragging without holding shift. And if I hold shift, it actually will now drag the animation timeline with the notify. Um, and this makes it really nice for precise placement. Because say I want this window to happen just as Echo is taking off. And then I want it to end just as she's about to land. You get really nice precise tuning uh, control by holding shift. And you can see that being useful for like, you know, sync markers or audio notifies or really any kind of notify that you want to have synced up to an event in the animation. That's um, awesome. And so I can just come back and play That's this great. here. And now I don't get that weird sudden um, um, motion of her getting pulled in. Um, and, you know, we, Chance did a good job of showing this off in the uh, intro to the. Valley of the Ancients demo that came out a while ago, but you can see like if we have tall objects, she'll now um, clear them, and small lower objects, she'll <clears> make <throat> contact with them. If she's not aligned perfectly, she'll reach them. Um, like she'll actually rotate to align to the object. Um, and uh, I guess the last one I'd like to show is if I make this object um, longer. Um, I don't know what she's yeah. flying out there, but <laughs> see that way, that's fine. Um, if I pull this object back, I guess for some reason she's like become childed to that. I don't know what's going on. I don't want to debug that. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but here, she'll actually, the point I wanted to make is she'll actually clear the obstacle. So she'll clear the obstacle and land where we wanted her to. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention here is that green debug draw. That's showing where the... Um, character actually went so the blue is like the theoretical like where we warped mm. the motion the green is where it actually went um and if we look at her capsule like i'll just do show collision here real quick you can see that um her capsule actually juts out pretty far um from her body and if i then go to i'm not sure how well this is going to come through but if you watch really carefully, as she gets to the object, the capsule goes bonk into the uh, um, into the obstacle. Um, so there's a few things you can do there. Like sometimes when you're interacting with an ob object, you have to turn collision off. Like if you imagine you got a character um, getting into a car, you're going to have to disable collision with the car so that you don't uh, get your capsule just bumping up against it. Um, you could do something like that here and just be careful that you turn collision back on when they're not interpenetrating. Um, you can also try to adjust the animation so that the root motion actually keeps the character and the capsule over, because um, you can see that blue line, it gets pretty close um, to the obstacle and the capsule is pretty big. Um, right. but yeah, I just wanted to point out that's that's the purpose of that um, that green line is to tell you where the where we actually went. So you can see like, oh no, I'm actually colliding with things. I, I think we actually turned the collapse, uh, the capsule off and went to like hover movement for her. Oh um, yeah, that makes during sense. that, yeah, and then right when she cleared the other side, or maybe when she landed, turning turned it back on. And also too, um, you, you talk about like you know seeing those two things together. I think even something else we did with our animator was we kind of got the spaces in which we felt that the base animation was going to fall apart by warping it too far. You know, where it's like there's not enough force when she jumped to clear. You know, like a six foot fence. Um, and it was kind of a little bit of a back and forth, right? Between like, okay, this is kind of what we feel feels good. Those are tiny edits we can make to the animation to make it to where she's clipping on this side here. Let's just try to work on that a little bit. Um, or change a little bit with the the actual dimensions of the of the geometry. But in general, I think we, we got, you know, a couple of different super small, much bigger, and then kind of the the middle ground there in between the three. And like you can, 
Especially if you, like, probably one of the biggest takeaways with motion warping is it works really well when the character's feet aren't on the ground. Like with the portal demo, you can see the feet sliding. In this case, um, when Echo's in the air, uh, we can really hide a lot of that motion um, just because you don't see her making contact and sliding along anything. Um, but there's still going to be limits. Um, at mm -hmm. a certain point, you are going to need to alter your animation or have multiple animations to cover all your scenarios. Right. Um, so uh, last point I wanted to make about um, uh, the vaulting example is, like I've mentioned, like here I've manually annotated um, <clears throat> the object. Um, I did a little test just to prove to myself it would work um, with uh, the environment to create system. And you can see here I get a uh, blue sphere as I walk up to these different objects. And that's picking a warp point for me. And so I can trigger my own vault. And my player character here can start uh, vaulting objects. Um, and I won't go into an EQS um, demo, um, <laughs> but uh, really cool. you can find lots of stuff online. But mm -hmm. I'm basically I'm, I'm projecting a cone in front of me. I'm looking for objects that are at the right height. Um, and then I'm taking the closest one that's the closest in front of me um, and using that to pick my warp point. Uh, so I just wanted to show, like, Unreal does come with some interesting terrain mm -hmm. analysis tools like EQS that you could play around with for uh, for things like a vaulting example. Yeah, um, we we ended up just uh, using Blueprint components, uh, and um, and uh, I think a collision on our character to find those vault points, right, to move over things. But EQS yeah. seems pretty elegant. Yeah, and I mean, if anyone wants to look at that, it's in this game playability. I think GA Vault. Um, this is in the demo. Uh, there's the set fault sync points for montage where it's doing the terrain analysis and um, people could go in and, and look at what this is doing. You sort of imagine there's like collision volumes and traces going around in the world to um, figure out the, the shape of the things in front of you. Um, so yeah, that's all there for people to see if they want to open that up and see how we did it for the um, the official demo. Uh, and one last point, just because I want to cover all the options that are in uh, um, these windows, is uh, one here is we have rotation type. Um, I don't have a great animation to demo uh, this facing option. What default does is it um, takes wherever I'm rotating and aligns me so I'm, I'm facing the direction the object is facing. So you imagine a door. If you're going to interact with a door, you actually walk so you position yourself in line and you're facing the door. Um, for something more like, say, a melee attack, you don't actually, like, if you're going to punch someone, you don't actually walk yourself in front of them <laughs> and throw your punch. You just want, from wherever you are, you just want to rotate yourself so you're facing um, your target. Um, you don't care about their facing. You just want to make sure you're facing them. Um, so that's these options here, uh, the rotation type. You can rotate yourself to face the object or rotate yourself to face the same way the object is facing. Um, Got it. Yeah, and finally, um, I should be able to uh, demo this pretty quickly, is uh, there's been some questions about the uh, modifier types. Uh, so if you come in to, I'm going to open my new animation. Uh, well, I should say my new montage. It's the same animation. Uh, here we go. Oh, and that actually leads me to an interlude here. Um, you can see here, when I, when I open that montage, um, I lost my last one. Um, so see, we always, by default, open an animation in the same tab as the last animation you had open. Uh, and that can get annoying if you like you go through a bunch of folders or you search and you find an animation, and then you go try to open another, and you're like, oh, no, no, I got to go find that last animation again. Um, so a little trick uh, that's been around for a while is I can actually hold Shift and double click, uh, and that'll open in a new tab. Um, but even better, in UE5, uh, thanks to John Vanderberg, if you come to Editor Preferences, uh, come down to Animation Editor. There's now a checkbox, Always Open Animation Assets in New Tab. And you oh, can just nice. check that once, forget That's about awesome. it, and uh, yeah. Yeah, you just always get that. So oh, man. thanks, John, for doing that. Cause that's when huge. was that tip four months ago? Could have <laughs> used that one. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I, that's just my default now. Um, I love it. Yeah. Um, I've had to unlearn holding Shift to open things. Um, so yeah, I just want to quickly go through, like, um, if I were to add a notify, uh, a motion warping notify to this, and I'll 
I'll just make it cover the whole animation um, just for demo purposes. Uh, we've got these modifier um, types, and people have been asking, like, what what is the difference between all of these? So I'll start with mm. scale because that's the simplest. Uh, what scale does is it basically um, just scales the root motion always of the animation. Um, so you can see here, like, when Echo does the vault, she's doing it along the Y axis. So if I set this to two um, and come in here and play this example, I should probably go over there. Um, and what I've done here is I've just put a target point on the ground and fed that to her in the blueprint to say, this is your target point. Um, but you'll notice with um, oh, with this montage, the scale doesn't take a point because it just uniformly scales the motion of the uh, animation. So she's just going to arbitrarily um, jump twice as far because I've set that. And use cases for this would be, say, like mm -hmm. a designer is tweaking a dodge animation, um, and they just want it to go a little bit further. Um, you don't have to go back and reauthor the animation and adjust it and re-export it. You can just uh, put these little tags here and do tuning on the montage. That's great. And could you do that dynamically, too? Could you pass that information in, that scale? Uh, currently, no. Um, but I don't see why we couldn't support that. Um, mm. So yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Yeah, just basically knowing if you've got a dodge, um, you know, oh, it's not safe to dodge one percent or whatever. If you or if you're going to dodge two into something as opposed to colliding with something and then you know finishing the animation in place. Um, yeah, I think that'd be useful. That down. We already have the concept of gameplay, like being able to send us information by, you know, having a named sync point. So we could have mm -hmm. a similar concept where we have like an optional yeah. name here. You could say like gameplay is going to tell you the uh, the scale. No, oh, that's cool. Um, so moving past uh, chance scope creeping, um, <laughs> we'll go to. Uh, so I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, we'll go to simple warp here. Um, and I've just, in the blueprint that controls this modifier type demo, it's literally a montage and it has a sync point and it gives the location and rotation of that point that I was just showing. I called it my sync point because I'm really good at naming things. Mm -hmm. So cool. if if I call it my sync point, and I'm just going to leave um, um, everything on except Z. I, by default, we ignore Z. Um, it's basically you're just like warping on a 2D plane, like the portal example. But I'm going to let it um, up affect Z. So if I reset here, here, and I play, oh, I was not expecting that. Um, so if I do that, I get really bad results, <laughs> and I become very <laughs> unhappy. There goes Echo. Yeah, I can't explain that. Live demos. Uh, I wonder if I turn this on. Yeah, so let's go with that for now. Um, but <clears throat> the point I wanted to make here um, is the the simple warp is really good for warping linear motion. Um, and if you but if you have an arc, it's not the best. It'll uh, it basically just constantly pulls you towards your target. Um, so we actually used just simple warp in the, the Valley of the Ancients demo, um, because when you're on the ground and you're warping towards the portal, um, that's a very linear motion in the animation. Echo just walks forward. Um, and the same with the vault is we actually, like Echo does have an arc to her animation here where she comes up and then she goes down, but we had separate windows. So we never had a point where we actually had a curve in the animation. Um, but what we can do is, Go over to skew warp, um, and this was. Oh, I gotta add my sync point back, and I'm gonna turn ignore z axis off. Uh, this was developed by Jaron Peterson, and um, what it will do is it'll actually stretch the animation, um, like the motion of the animation. You can sort of imagine if you had a deflated balloon and you drew a curve and then you stretched it so that the end of the curve reached the point you wanted. Um, that's a really rough way of explaining what this is doing. Uh, so here I play, and we can see we actually get the motion we want. The red there again is the uh, um, the motion from the animation, and the green is showing the uh, the warped motion. Um, and if you're sort of wondering, like, well, what's like the tips and tricks for using these? Just play around with them. Um, you can sort of maybe default to trying simple warp, um, and then if you 
don't get the results you want because there's some curve in your animation. You could do skew, skew warp. Um, the last one here um, that I don't want to dwell on because it's very, very um, experimental is basically just here as a test right now is the adjustment blend warp. This was inspired um, by Dan Lowe's talk, the animate button. You can find it on YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Um, we didn't um, implement adjustment um, <clears throat> blending like he was uh, describing, but what we're basically doing is we're just taking the IK effectors of the character um, and stretching the like uh, adjusting those as well um, as the root, and we only do that when the feet are actually in motion. So you sort of get um, a, a stride. Uh, uh, we sort of extend the stride of the character or shorten the stride of the character mm. um, when they're in air. It provides some really nice results, but there's uh, a lot of issues with it, and it's kind of hard to set up. You have to give it um, IK bones, and you have to have an IK. Um, set up in your graph to respond to it. Um, early results are super promising. Um, if you think of like the classic problem in a fighting game where you play an attack that takes you, you know, two meters forward, but there's something in front of you and your feet are just sort of sliding on the ground while you're attacking, um, this can actually keep the feet planted right. during the attacks and it can look really good during like rotational things. So uh, we're excited about the prospects of this. It's sitting right there, so I wanted to address it, but um, it's not something that we're ready to, you know, um, document and uh, recommend people use. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then I guess I wanted to show one more little trick that is another thing that's sort of been in Unreal for as long as I know, but I always encounter people who don't know it. Um, I've messed with this animation, and sometimes, you know, you'll mess with a bunch of things and you don't remember exactly what you did. Um, if I browse to it in the content browser and right click, I can go to Asset Actions Reload, and that'll actually undo my save changes. It's telling me here that I'm in Pi, so I can't do it. So I'll quit Pi um, and try that again. And say yes. And now it just pops up, and it's back to the way it was on disk before I started messing with it. Um, so just a little tip in case uh, some people out there didn't know. Um, Other than yeah, going to Perforce and syncing latest force. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or 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 cheeky like checking the file out and then reverting it. That's yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Thanks for everyone for for listening. And I'll just say like again, there's limitations to the system. It's early. Um, it only works for montages right now. You saw here live. There there are some bugs to work out. And uh, yeah, and then the final tip is just. Um, this stuff really works well when you're actually in motion and the feet aren't planted. Um, like the vault example is a great use case of this tech. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. And, and, and to clarify too, it only works with root motion and montages right now. That's correct? That is correct, yes. Because cool. it's basically it's telling the root motion system to do the movement. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's warping that motion from the motion in the animation. So if you don't have root motion, there's nothing to warp. But, the cool thing you can do is you can make you can re-import with root motion, right? Like if you have the the data already, and then you can just make a montage from it from there. I think the original ones we had in there didn't have root motion, and adding them was like a five minute task, right? So yeah, it's generally not that. hard to just yeah. uh, export with root motion. Um, uh, but yeah, currently only with montages, and like Chance is saying, uh, only montages with root motion. Great, that's awesome. Cool. Ready for some questions, Aaron, in regards to motion? Yeah, hit me. Cool. Um, Juan M. Gomez is wondering, will motion wall as a plugin for uh, UE4? No. Easy one to get started with. Um, next question <laughs> comes from Yvain Tisserand, who's wondering, what happens if the distance between the character and the reference position is far, like two meters? Um. It's something you can play with. Like, uh, I mean, if the question there is like, what happens if we're trying to warp too far? Um, if the feet are planted, it's going to look really bad. Your feet are going to slide a lot. Um, if you're in air, it really depends on your animation. If there's already a lot of momentum in your animation, you can get away with, with stretching more. But if you have sort of a character just jump up and land, for example, and you're trying to make that hit um, a point two meters away, it's going to look pretty weird. Kind of as a follow up to that, just because I'm interested, um, is there 
like this, this so this just works on root motion montages so it's not just grounded characters right like if you had something that, that didn't touch the ground you could use this to kind of move around right based on gameplay yeah. pretty much anything that's yeah knock yourself but, out with this stuff if you so like a little a, flo a floating drone or something you know you could have a if you had a nice animation that does a whole lot of little you know articulation with it or whatnot um you could of course just use like some of the actor movement stuff um, that's in the, the editor itself or in the engine but if you needed the actual to play an actual animation um you could get you probably get away with a lot that way yeah and if you had that drone um mostly root motion driven um you could get you could keep a lot of that animated motion like that character of the motion mm -hmm. but just uh, be able to make it move further or shorter interesting cool I'm trying to dig questions with you here, uh, Victor. My that was just typing. Screen screen got um, jumbled. One second. We got uh, another one from Last Devil, who is wondering: Is it possible to use motion warping on animation assets uh, like animation sequence and animation blueprint, other than montages? Uh, not right now. No. Another question from Last Devil that a couple of um, folks in chat were curious about: Can motion warping be used in tandem with ability task uh, root motion? Uh, that's something that we um, want to consider for the future. Um, right now, you know, this stuff's pretty experimental. Um, and uh, we, haven't, we haven't tested it, but I don't think it's going to work right now. One thing that was uh, kind of touched on earlier, but um, since it was asked, I figure we'll we'll get to it just in case it wasn't. Uh, it's can you dynamically change from Patty Walker? Uh, can you dynamically change the capsule shape for warping? That way, you can still get it to collide with specific uh, situations you might still want, but not things you don't. And I think the answer is yes, right? Hey, go ahead, Patty. We won't stop you. <laughs> Great. Uh, but yes, that is totally a legitimate um, way to handle some of these things is to adjust the capsule size. We were just talking about some of that for the use case of a VR avatar as well. As you're ducking, you want to adjust that collision capsule so that you can totally. you know, crawl under things in VR. And there's one here from Emad BK. Um, can different animations be made for a range of different dimensions to vault over? And I think, Aaron, this was the first uh, motion warping example I ever saw was specifically that, right? Nintendo with blueprints. Um, yeah, totally. Um, if you had something like, you know, because like I was saying, like there are limits to this. So you could start with one animation and see like, okay, this is like um, my one animation just isn't making enough coverage for different things, uh, different scenarios. And so you can start introducing more. And from the gameplay side, you're you're basically picking your animation. Um, and once you just have that one animation, you you warp it with the... Uh, you can sort of imagine you pick your montage and then you feed it all the same information, but you have different montages appropriate for different kind of scenarios. <clears throat> That's totally the way where you would, you know, you'd start a project with uh, one vault um, that an animator sort of blocks in and then animators could come in and anytime they're unhappy with the warping, they could start adding their own animation, like new animations. Yeah, and it's just like uh, the way I was thinking about it is if you've ever done like non-uniform scale of assets in a map for like level design, right? There's a certain point where it starts to fall apart. It's less believable when you have one that's at 1.8 and one that's at 0.5, right? And it's kind of similar here too. You kind of want to find where those bounds are. And then at those points, you'll build the other ones, the other animations that are, you know, built to take a different range of bounds that you could switch to based on that same information you're querying. Um, actually, sorry, I wanted to go back to the question from Patty Walker, because I think he's trying to lay a trap for me. Um, there's one thing that you might run into problems with is if you are increase if you're changing your capsule size and it's actually changing where the root is, um, I think it's going to work, but you might run into s some issues. Um, I think that'd be something worth testing because um, we're warping where the root's going. And if you're having the, you're changing the capsule and it's actually changing where the root's going, right. but maybe that's what, why he asked. Got um, one on replication. I assume this information is replicated just fine. Yeah, we've tried it. I mean, where you could get into problems if is if you have some desync between your clients about where they're warping to. Um, you could start mm -hmm. getting corrections. Um, we've done some tests; it's worked. Um, I'll still throw out the disclaimer that um, we're experimental. We haven't shipped a, right. a replicated example of this yet. So you say that some of the desync issues would be more about like, hey, I passed data into the motion warping system, but it didn't get replicated appropriately. So 
you might see different things one client versus the other because of that. That's a really egregious example, but yeah, okay. if, like two clients have different places they're trying to warp to. Of course, you're going to start yeah. having corrections. I have another question from T. Gorsny, who's wondering: Is it possible to animate motion warping per bone? Bone. Um, I'd say the the one thing we have. I'm not sure I totally understand. The one thing we are going to add is the ability to say that that offset with the bone. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we are only warping the root of the character because we're just warping the root motion. Um, Siegfriedo, 1911. Can you use the motion warping system to track a moving target? Not right now. So it's basically uh, whatever data it got when it started, the 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 montage is kind of what you got? Yeah, I mean, we do have this concept of add or update sync point. Um, you could do some tests where, um, like that uh, function we were looking at here, um, the intent of this is that you can keep updating the location. So from the game side, you could try constantly updating um, that location. Might, might be a little strange but... watching some of that, like Echo, things floating the whole time trying to... <laughs> it just cannot reach that target. <laughs> oh, that's right. I have another question from VR Division who's wondering, are there ways to access motion warping using Sequencer? Uh, no. Not right now. Let's see, Gal Ramirez is wondering, when will the spline IK, IK ex exit experimental um, status and will it be able to be used for motion warping as well? Jeremiah? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'd have to get back to you. I think that's the best answer I can get. Um, the, yeah, that's a two-parter. So the spline IK being experimental, that's something uh, we'll look into. Whether or not that can be used for uh, motion warping, is that about defining the traje trajectory or? I would need more context around. The Let us know, Gal. There. We'll repeat the question. Let's see, only a few more here that's come in in regards to motion warping, and then we're going to continue with full body IK. Um, a few couple questions, if it's possible to. Uh, so this one is from, last one is from Johnny Boy. Could you motion warp between two different heights where you blend between two different animations of the same action? Uh, we haven't done any tests where we're doing, uh, we're warping to, like we're blending and warping two montages. Um, like if we had a, if we look at a montage here, like we can have multiple tracks that are playing animations and you could have slot nodes in your, your graph and have some sort of um, blend between them. Um, We've, we haven't done any kind of testing with having two animations blending together and warped at the same time. All right. And with that, I think it's time to hand it over to Kieran. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for all the questions. Well, yeah, and thanks, for Aaron. everyone. Just want to make sure if there are more questions in regards to motion warping, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the live stream as well. We're just now moving on to uh, Kieran's presentation, and then we can get back to them. So keep them coming. Aaron, I'll try not to scope creep you like I did, Aaron. So. Hey, by all means, go, all right, <laughs> go ahead. Cool. That was awesome stuff, Aaron. I love motion warping. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you a quick introduction to what full body IK is. Then we'll set one up together. And, and after that, I'll hand it over to Jeremiah uh, to show you how it looks in the context of a full working behavior. So very quickly. Um, a quick reminder, why would we use IK at all? What do we use IK for in video games? Um, so I could I identified basically two main use cases. You want to maintain contact with some part of the character and some part of the world, like keeping your feet locked to the ground or hands onto a doorknob. And also you want to procedurally modify a pose in some way, like take a character that's having a normal uh, walk and drag their hips down so that they're uh, crouch walking. Um, so then the question might be, uh, why would we use full body IK? We already have lots of IK. Um, what does full body IK give us that uh, that we can't get already? Um, so first and foremost, the reason you might want to use full body IK is for a greater range of motion. With a single chain IK, um, you're really limited to 
the distance from the start of that chain. So if you're running IK on an arm, you can't reach any contact point that's further away than the length of the arm bones. Um, with full body IK, you can engage the whole body to reach a contact point, which greatly increases the range of motion. Um, and you get multiple effectors. So with a single chain, you have a single effector. Um, but if with a full body IK, you can have multiple effectors that are with multiple trying to reach multiple contact points simultaneously. And that might not be something that's possible to do if you just use multiple single chain IKs because it might need to actually move the root of the character in some way so that all of those contact points can be simultaneously uh, resolved. And finally, uh, one of the main advantages of full body IK is that you get uh, you get a pose applied to the core, torso, spine region of your character. Um, so single chain IK is going to affect just that single chain, you know, usually up to a shoulder or a hip. And, uh, you know, think about uh, a dog. So if you wanted to uh, have a dog stand up with its front feet on a table, if you did that with single chain IK, you'd basically like robotically pull his hands up to the table and is it the rest of his body is going to remain kind of in a, in that flat pose uh the goal or what full body ik can, can provide is a way for the the character to the dog to like fully like you know tilt their entire body up and and get a more natural pose where uh the spine is involved in uh in achieving it so you built this for dogs that got on tables. That's right. This is a lot of work to get good looking dogs on tables. <laughs> it's a co common in the game dev sphere challenge we've been tackling for the last 20 years. Super it's, cool. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so it does help to have a basic understanding of, of what's going on under the hood with Unreal's full body IK solver. Um, I've identified basically three types of solvers that are out there and um, Unreal actually has all of them. So there's the heuristic methods, like uh, cyclic coordinate descent and fabric. These are available in Control Rig right now. Um, and they can actually be applied to full body, but they have some disadvantages in terms of uh, the control that they give to the user over the resulting pose. Then there's the, the category um, I'm calling gr gradient descent methods. And uh, this is sort of the state-of-the-art stuff that you'll find in robotics research and literature. Um, and it uses numerical optimization methods to basically um, gradually adjust all the rotation angles on all the bones in the skeletons to reduce the total amount of error. And the error is usually uh, a function of the distance between the end effectors and your goal locations. Um, one major downside of gradient descent methods is the fact that you do have to calculate the gradient, which involves uh, usually using something called finite differences, where you noodle each one of those rotation angles on, on your bones, see how your error gets better or worse, and then figure out some way to, to adjust them all a minute amount so that you reduce the error overall. And then you do that in, in an iteration. And even just getting that gradient matrix is expensive, so uh, there's kind of an upper limit on how fast these methods can be, though they, do, they can give good results. Uh, finally, we have the analytical methods. These are like two bone solvers that use basic trigonometry to figure out how to rotate bones to reach an end effector. Um, there's no known analytical method to do full body IK, so this is purely for uh, very simple IK. Um, the method that we're using for Unreal's full body IK solver uh, is sort of heavily inspired by rigid body simulation. Um, I'm not sure if it fits neatly into any of those three categories. It's kind of a, its own special thing. Um, so what we do is uh, this kind of one, two, three method here. First of all, we split the body into segments, each of which can move independently. So um, if we're thinking about an arm, your lower arm would be a segment, your upper arm would be a segment, each spine bone would be a segment. And then we create constraints between the tip segments and the effectors that are being pulled around to goal locations. And those generate forces internally, which pull the segments towards your goals which pulls the character apart. And so we create more constraints between the segments at the joint locations that pull all those uh, uh, segments back together and, and keep everything glued together so it's not pulled apart. And we, we'll take a look. Uh, I can show you what that looks like because you can turn off the, the glue and you can see what it looks like when it gets all pulled apart. And finally, just a few pro tips I want to preface um, before we dive into the solver. Some things you should expect 
in terms of what this this type of approach to IK is going to give give you, uh, what you can expect out of it. So things you should do. Uh, do use full body IK to modify a, a good underlying pose, um, meaning that it's some it's meant to operate on top of animation. It's not a replacement for animation. It's a way to modify your your pose, not necessarily generate it from scratch. Um, and to that to that effect, do go ahead and help out the IK by using control rig. And Jeremiah will show you um, all the things that they did to Echo uh, before it even got to the IK in terms of modifying her pose to, to get the best result out of it. And uh, do continue to use those other IK methods, the single chain IK, when you when you don't need it. When you can get away with single chain IK, it, it will be faster. It'll probably be simpler to set up. Um, so this is not by no means a total replacement. It's just another tool in your toolbox. Uh, things you shouldn't do. Don't expect full body IK to fix a bad input um, or to generate. <laughs> to generate a full body pose for you from scratch. So a lot of people think, okay, I have this full body IK, I should be able to, you know, maybe I want a character that's holding a gun. Uh, you know, I could just put their hand effectors where the where they belong and I'll get a character who looks like they're holding a gun. Not you're not like let's be to to be honest, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get an art directed pose that's competitive with what a, a professional animator can achieve. So make sure that you're feeding a, a decent pose into your full body icon and, and and think of this as a way to modify the pose so you know to to reach those contact points and to get the precision that you're looking for. Um and the second point here, don't start with perfectly straight limbs. IK works best when you give it a hint of what direction to bend in. I will show you methods of kind of forcing straight limbs to bend in the right direction, but the point is that you will have to force them. So the the more the the closer you get your initial pose, um, sort of looking like it's going to bend in the right direction, the the easier it is for the solver to pick up and modify. Kind of hints to the solver that this is what I'm supposed to do, as opposed to having to make deductions uh, based on a straight line. Exactly. There, there's yeah. an infinite number of ways it could bend it, and anything it chooses is going to be arbitrary. It's not magic. It has no. There's, there is no concept. There's no like machine learning yeah. model going on in the background here, trying to figure out which way to bend your limbs. That's um, going to be true of any IK, really, the truth. Yeah, is. Right. Certainly. Don't lock your knees. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's kind of similar to that point is uh, if you start with kind of a bad setup, you might find that you really are, are just going uh, to the extreme in terms of setting up joint limits and constraints and preferred angles and stiffness values to force that, that uh, solver to achieve the pose that you want. Um, and, that, and then you're going to have to crank up the iterations to compensate to make sure that you get convergence. And that's a good indication that you're kind of um, fighting the solver rather than working with it, and that maybe you should adjust your input pose to get a, an easier result. And lastly here, don't pull your uh, character outside of their capsule. So full body IK, unlike single chain solvers, will happily translate your character. It actually applies translation to the root bone. And there's a little, you know, there's a danger there that you could pull your character right out of their capsule. OK, so let's uh, see how to set this up. Actually, While you're maybe this... mm -hmm. uh, the solver that you're seeing here is the new solver in UE5 Early Access. Uh, we released full body IK in 4.2.6. This version is a, a newer version that's not relying on a Jacobian method. Rather, it's relying on this newer method that uh, Kieran described. Uh, a lot of the benefits that you'll see here is it's uh, faster and more deterministic. Um, and we have, we're able to set it up with simpler uh, parameters. So just wanted to highlight that it's a different under, underneath the entire node. If yeah, you are cool. migrating products from 4 to 6 to 5, uh, your node will still work and it'll just show a little deprecated. Uh, yeah, you'll get a red deprecated warning at the top of the node. Um, and in in our limited tests, admittedly, um, we are seeing significant performance improvements with the solver, um, which is to be expected because, as I described, it's not doing a gradient descent, so it doesn't have to calculate those gradients and um, and invert matrices. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at a, a simple setup. This is something that you might actually be interested in in a production. Um, I've got a character with this is just a control rig with a single full body IK node uh, with an effector on each foot and one on the head. So 
I thought this might be uh, a setup that you could be interested in if you were doing um, maybe something like a, a skateboard or surfing type setup where the character's feet need to remain planted, but you might want to um, adjust the character's pose, say if they're going up and down a slope, uh, maybe leaning into something side to side, and uh, essentially giving uh, getting this like single degree of freedom here on the head control that you could drive procedurally. So you could move this thing side to side, uh, back and forward, back, back and backward and forward, or up and down. Um, and uh, this is sort of that second point where you want to procedurally modify a pose, and this is kind of an example of, of that. Um, so uh, I think it would be helpful because there's, it, it's helpful to watch someone set one of these things up from scratch because you can easily get into what's termed parameter hell where there's a lot of parameters. And uh, I think you'll find that there's a lot of repeating parameters. So once you understand them, they're not so scary. Mm. And I'm here to help you out. So I'm going to create a control rig. And import the skeletal mesh for echo. So this is like any other control rig. There's nothing full body IK yet. Okay, so we have, have echo here. We have our forward solve. This should be a review for most of you. And I'm going to create a full body IK node. So the first thing you're going to need to do before you get any IK at all is set a root bone. And this is where a lot of people get hung up. They expect, uh, well, you know, there's a root bone right here. Shouldn't I just plug that in? Um, what we're looking for here is the topmost uh, bone in your skeleton that is skinned. So this is the bone that is going to translate to kind of move the whole character. And in that case, it's the pelvis bone. It might be called hips or center of gravity or something on your, on your uh, particular character. But... Um, it's not necessarily the root bone. In fact, it never is. And that is a change uh, that you'll notice between the 426 version of the solver and the five early access version. Mm. That's right. Um, so now we're going to add those effectors. We had uh, three of them. So we'll go through and find the head and both feet. I'm going to create new controls under the feet. And I'll unparent those. And his head, the head should be somewhere. I'll take this opportunity to let everyone know that there are a couple of live streams that we've done already with Jeremiah on Control Rig, <clears throat> where um, we walk through several different ways to use Control Rig, actually. And these are all applicable to U5 as well, right, Jeremiah? That's right, absolutely. I highly recommend watching. I hear I hear the prisoner was top notch. <laughs> and you made those you made those points, uh, Kieran, so they would be in the appropriate location, and then you deparented them. Was that the the intent there? That's the whole thing. Yep. Okay. Um, we're we're matching the the full transform, the position and rotation Got of it. those equivalent bones, so that we can and pipe then, that transform. But then you don't the want. Factors. And you don't want that to be in the hierarchy anymore, though, right? You just need that That's information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's yeah. in the hierarchy, you'll know. You'll know very quickly because it'll <laughs> create a cycle and start kind of flipping yeah. up. Great. Um, so I'm just gonna connect these up, and we're not gonna get any IK until I fill in all these red fields here. But um, just attaching the full transform. This is also a little bit simpler than the previous node, which required, I think, separate translation. And. Uh, Rotation connections. Oh, what am I doing? Foot R. L and head. So these are just the bones that correspond to those effectors. And at this point, if everything's set up right, we should actually have some IK running. OK, cool. Um, I've got everything selected at once, so she's kind of skating around. But uh, We're going to see uh, some issues. So probably not what you want to see right off the bat, but um, this is why I wanted to do this walkthrough is to show you like, you know, you're going to get uh, a solver just doing what it's going to do. And it's up to you to kind of to, to put some boxes around the results and make sure that things bend in the right direction. And you can so, do all this inside this animation 
editor right here, right? You can do a lot of this testing just right there in that viewport. Absolutely, yeah. This it's all going to be right in in Control Rig right. itself, so it's not too bad. And and when I talk about parameter hell, I'm really referring to these bone settings. But if you recognize that we're looking at the same set of settings for every bone, mm -hmm. I think it kind of starts to make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to add two bone settings, one for each uh, each knee, and we're going to fix um, the fact that the knees aren't really bending when you when I pull the feet up. So I'm going to set one to the left calf and one to the right calf. And we're going to use this feature called a preferred angle. So I'm going to check on use preferred angle for both. And I know a priori that the knees bend in the Z direction. I'm going to put a value of 45 degrees to basically say when that uh, effector on the leg is being pulled up, go ahead and just pre-rotate that knee joint 45 degrees to help the solver out. And this, this is that point I was talking about earlier where uh, straight limbs are going to give you a little grief, but you can kind of work around that by using preferred, preferred angles. So now the, the knees are bending before it starts to just kind of push the whole body out of the way. But uh, you'll notice that the the pelvis now is really doing this kind of crazy Elvis thing. So we'll settle the pelvis down. And That's the not spine. a feature. <laughs> yeah. I call it Elvis pelvis. It's a common problem with full bag. Nice. Elvis pelvis. I like that. Um, I think there's five spine joints. So bear with me while I go through each one of these in turn. Um, That's all good. This is super informative. I don't know much about this system, so. Uh, thank you for walking through all this. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I, we are well aware of the fact that the user experience around this is a bit laborious. And um, without going into details, there are some things that we have planned to to make this a lot faster. But it doesn't hurt to know um, how to set it up manually. We're at spinal four, and we got five spine joints on this on Echo. Okay. So starting up at the pelvis, I'm just going to go through and set the rotational stiffness to 0.9. And you can see straight away that that pelvis, Elvis pelvis is, is gone. And, uh, you know, it's starting to behave a little better. Um, I'm going to go through and do the same for all the spine joints so that it kind of moves. So the whole torso moves with uh, some sense of kind of rigidity. And right now, as, as Kieran's setting this up, this is something that uh, rather than just setting up a rig and, and immediately trying to add as many parameters as you can, um, and Kieran's doing this because he, he knows what's going to get the right effect, but start small, start with small adjustments, and slowly add in. Uh, like starting with the knees is great. Get the pelvis the way you, work, you want, and then start tweaking. I wouldn't go and just start adding bone settings for every bone that you have, you'll probably uh, have a bad time. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, your bread and butter is going to be your rotational stiffness and those preferred angles. Preferred angles mostly on on jointed limbs, like uh, elbows and knees, and stiffness on things like spines. Mm. Okay. Spines don't have a preferred angle, right? Because you don't want them to bend in the middle. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, Depends on your spine. You you could use a preferred angle on a spine. It's just usually not necessary because they're kind of more like a ball and socket joint. They can kind of okay. rotate around a bit. Makes sense. Okay, I, th I think we need some stiffness on our neck here. We're getting a chicken neck. <laughs> Bear with me while we add a few more bone settings. I think she's got two neck joints. So now we're starting to kind of get somewhere, right? Um, you'll notice that uh, mm. she, her head is peeling pretty far off the effector, and this is what um, we call convergence. So it's not really the solve isn't really converging right now, and that happens when you start adding more stiffness because the bones start to resist moving. You need more uh, iterations for them to actually reach where they're supposed to go. And so there's some really important settings I want to highlight on, at the very bottom of the node underneath the settings panel here. And these are your iterations and your mass multiplier. So the iterations, as it 
as you can probably imagine, uh, determine you know, how many times we're going to loop through and solve all of those constraints that I talked about in the presentation. And that will uh, help a lot with convergence. Um, it might seem a little excessive to go to 100, and probably is, but um, you should keep in mind, too, these iterations are actually pretty cheap. So here we're kind of you know, getting close to a setup I think you could use for procedurally modifying uh, your skateboard animation to to lean as you like. Um, I'll lastly mention the the mass multiplier. This is a global stiffness parameter, so it, it operates almost exactly like the rotational stiffness per bone, but it it applies to all the bones at once. Um, I'm not sure if we'll really notice much here by increasing it. Maybe she's going to move a little bit less, a little more stiffly. Yeah, actually she does. She kind of looks like a board now. Um, one thing to note though, if you immediately apply IK and notice that your, your solve is just like not converging at all, it's just flipping all over the place. Um, chances are you need to bump your mass multiplier up because this, uh, this value is sensitive to the global scale of your character. So if you have a really, really large character, uh, chances are you're going to get a bunch of spaghetti mangled up nonsense at the start. Um, don't panic, just drop down here and bump up that mass multiplier. Uh, in, in future iterations um, of, of this solver, we'll probably auto adjust that in the background to some extent to prevent it from at least never breaking. So you can just use it to adjust the, to, just to get the desired stiffness that you want. Um, so a uh, general question on that though, that mass is, has no bearing on physics itself, but just on the animation and how this is behaving, correct? Just on the results of the solver. The yeah. solver, cool. It, Internally, um, like I said, it, it splits the body up into segments. Um, internally, those segments have a mass that's proportional to the length of the body, so the long bones will rotate uh, less than smaller bones. And the mass multiplier just scales the mass of all the bones up so that they will rotate and translate less each iteration, which gives them a stiffer end result. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, so that's really all I wanted to do in terms of uh, giving you a, a broad overview of the the features of the solver, how you set it up from scratch. Um, I would say just a few things that uh, future iterations of the solver are getting faster. Um, we're, we're, there's a lot of pre-processing that we're able to do to allow you to get the same result with far fewer iterations. Um, and we're working on ways to make the, the setup process less laborious so that you don't have to um, you know, scroll up and down so much through uh, a big spreadsheet of settings but yeah long node is long yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah karen i'm actually going to expand a little bit more on that um so we are th this solver that you're seeing here is the beginning of a lot of work that um karen and the the team are working on around full body ik and extending that into um, new ways to retarget um, some of that includes, like right now, we, we're relying very heavily on Control Rig. Uh, Control Rig is already always able to reach into these solvers, drive them directly, and that gives you this ability to drive gameplay, uh, you know, feed uh, variables and parameters directly into Control Rig and uh, from blueprints or anything else really. Uh, but as we go forward towards uh, five, you'll see more development around this, specifically with uh, new editors new ways to set these parameters in a very user-friendly way. Um, so it's not always going to be this very long uh, node. You'll always be able to build this node and access the solver in Control Rig if you'd like. But we are making uh, much easier ways to, to interact with this. So stay yeah. tuned on those. Oh, super cool. Uh, and, one thing I noticed oh, here, uh, sorry, I, I just uh, noticed that um, there's nothing preventing the knees from breaking backwards here. So I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the uh, rotation limit settings. Um, so if we find the calf settings, uh, you can lock axes off completely. So we don't want the calves rotating off axis. They rotate their hinge joints that should only rotate in one axis. And we don't want them breaking backwards because as, as we all know, that would be very painful. Um, so I find a range of somewhere between like, zero and 130 degrees works pretty well for uh 
Or needs to be characters can feel pain. That's what I learned today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So now but, you'll see if I if I pull this off and skew it, the instead of kind of twisting the the knee to the side to reach the effector, it's going to bend more at the hip. Uh, right on. It's choosing yeah, the right spot. Now, Kieran, I may have been mistaken, but was there some sort of stretch setting at the end of this node? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, so this is very much experimental, and we're probably going to brush up this feature in the future. But if you hit allow stretch, the character will just kind of uh, the bones will translate to reach the effectors, which <laughs> could be useful for uh, cartoony characters. Yeah. Um. Oh wow, that's that awesome! That is fun. Yeah, imagine like a like a, a rubber person or like a squishy kind of you know like glob thing walking around. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, one thing I think it would make this feature more useful than a global allow stretch is doing it per effector. So right. Um, yeah, we're we're, def we're looking into a lot of different little features that we could add that would open up the solver to more and more use cases. And this is certainly one of them. Well, yeah, awesome. and, and Karen mentioned it a little bit earlier. Essentially what we're doing is we're breaking up the the character into limbs or into bone chains. And uh, that information is information that we can feed in to other areas of the solver. It's not all integrated right now, but um, that that's an example of once you apply the solver, it can detect, hey, these are generally the limbs that I have and that I care about. And then we apply weight settings to those or apply stiffness settings per limb. You know, there's all kinds of cool stuff that we'll be able to do with that. Yeah, there's there's stuff in UE5 main already um, that gives you more control over uh, the the part of the skeleton that the effector, that each effector is controlling. So. Mm. Right, now, right now, the most the control that the effectors have is essentially to blend how much of a strength they have, um, and I can demonstrate that by just turning the strength alpha to zero on the head, and you can see that the head is now you know not not being attracted towards its effector anymore. It's still a part of the solve, which is actually kind of interesting because it can it can help stabilize the solve. Um, you can see how. She's she's sort of leaning toward like you're, we're having to pull her torso towards us now, whereas if if there were no head effector at all, her torso would be just pointing straight, uh, straight up. Oh, I see. So, yeah. So you, I found this. I call them. I've been colloquially just referring to them as stabilizers. These effectors that have zero strength alpha. Um. So yeah, that's actually. I almost forgot to mention that. That's actually a fairly useful um, thing to have. Yeah, we're using that. Uh, on Echo in the Valley of the Ancient project as well. Oh, cool. That's super helpful. For dance um, speak too. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, um, unless there's any... Do you, do you want to take questions on the, the core solver before we dive into the Valley of the Ancient uh, production example? Or No, yeah, let, let's... I, I would say let's, let's show it in kind of a production setting, and then we can... That might yeah, answer questions on. that people may have. Go ahead, Jeremiah. OK, uh, let, let me get all set up here. Um, all right, so in uh, Valley of the Ancient, we use full body AK in two different cases. Uh, one is for Echo as she's running around, we're able to place her feet. And two is whenever the, uh, the Ancient one, the robot, is firing, we automatically adjust its attack position, the aiming of the arm to attack wherever Echo was at that time. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the aim attack first, since it's a smaller graph, and then we'll show the Echo's look. But before all of that, I want to address something that has been a question for several months now, which is, hey, can you release that slope warping demo from that live stream you did back in February? And hey, why haven't you released it yet? You promised you would release it. Well, you're right. I did promise to release it, but we were actively working on this project, and we were redoing that slope warp setup uh, to be a bit more simple and um, take a more additive approach. So with Valley of the Agent, we released this. Uh, it's called Echo Slope Warping. 
And uh, this is the one that I recommend everyone start uh, taking a look at. Yes, it is in UE5, but pretty much all of the concepts apply directly to UE4. Uh, it's going to use a slightly different solver, and we are using control rig functions here, but um, I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So just to get that out of the way before we get more questions of when am I going to release it. I released it. Not the same version, but a better version. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm actually going to start. I'm going to try and not make this a control rig tutorial since I tend to go that way, um, but everything's integrated. So I want to talk first about how are we even getting data to the full body IK solver. Um, so we're going to start with the ancient one, AnaBP. And that uh, AnaBP can be found in the ancient battle content characters, ancient one, and this uh, blueprint. All right, so with that, let me adjust my mic. The lawn guys just showed up, so hopefully we're fine. Um, this is what you're going to see. It looks pretty straightforward. It's just a state machine, conveniently called temp state machine. Um, don't mind that. We did ship it that way. That's proper game dev. And, and a control rig. So this control rig is, uh, has an alpha on it. It has a uh, two parameters that are being fed in. One is the reach amount, which is essentially a multiplier giving us an art directable approach for how much we want to reach. Um, this lets us uh, quickly art, kind of art direct that reach amount without having to dive into the control rig. Uh, so it's just a fixed value that we, I think we have it set to 0.5 somewhere, reach amount, yeah, 0.5. Um, and I'm treating this as a zero to one value. Zero would be not at all. One would be my hand is on echo, so reaching across. The <laughs> so That's great. Uh, and then uh, second is the laser location. This is where what is my target? Where am I supposed to fire? Uh, so we're using that value to aim the hand at uh, that specific location. Um, and yeah, so we have both an aim location and a reach amount. That reach amount is going, I don't know, my hands. Yeah, all right. There, there, there. there. there we go. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the uh, that, that's the amount that we're adjusting uh, our hands. So this this is reach amount. This is target location or loca laser location. Uh, one quick tip that I want to talk about is this F and Terp Alpha 10 colon two, what the heck is that? Well, this is something that nearly every skeletal node has in AnaBPs. You just click on a skeletal node and click try to make one. Um, and it's modified, the most basic. And I select this node. You can see that there at the bottom is this alpha scalar something, something. Let me get this bigger. Alpha, alpha scale bias clamp. You extend. Expand that, and you have a whole bunch of really cool, useful settings. If you want to make it so you can blend a node on and blend it off uh, smoothly and interpolated, rather than creating a whole node graph in your event graph or a node graph in your blueprint that and some sort of timeline to do some interpolation, you can just type in some values here. So in this case, I'm I can say interpolate automatically. Now this see how it changed to f interp alpha. That's now going to interpolate the value whenever it changes um, based off of this uh, setting, which is this increase and decrease. You may notice we have two settings, increasing and decreasing. I can have it uh, have it the weight change faster as the number is going up and slower as the value is going down. Mm. That's super helpful. In fact, that's what we're using here. So I'm saying whenever my alpha uh, controlling alpha value changes, which is being set by our blueprint. Um, I want it to fire really quickly and then slowly pull the hand back. I don't want it to snap back. Uh, so that will blend this control rig on very quickly and slowly blend it off. So another place where I can kind of art direct the behavior. Uh, Kieran mentioned that uh, full body AK often is not, it's not supposed to be the animation, it's supposed to enhance the on and, and like layer on top of the animation works with it. So um, this is one way that we can help 
improve the way that that uh, that those work together. All right, so we have our state machine. These are just the animations of our uh, robots, and it's outputting a pose, and Control Rig is consuming that pose. So let's just jump on in here. Let's look at the rig graph. All right, there we go. This looks a lot friendlier. Um, I'm going to talk through a few things. I'm going to try and stay focused, I promise. Uh, let's adjust this a little bit. So in the base graph, this is really simple. We're taking advantage of a, couple, of a control rig feature here, which is functions. So I actually created two functions for you all. Uh, one is using full body IK, and one is just using basic IK. So you can see the limitations and when I would want to use full body IK versus just a two bone basic IK. Uh, and that can just toggle through a pool. If you ever want to change it and check it out, you can uh, change the variable uh, here. And uh, you can even set that in the NBP if you want. Um, so the first thing we're doing, and, and this is something I like to encourage everyone to do, is we are setting a control. We're taking our data outside, so this laser location, and I'm actually going to move a control to that location. Uh, it's much easier to see controls moving around in, the, in this view than it is to just hope that whatever math is coming in is correct. Um, mm -hmm. So I like to assign everything to a control that I care about. I can debug it really easily and understand what's happening in one place instead of bouncing through a bunch of editors. Uh, I'm using the from world. So that is essentially taking this laser location saying, where is this from the world relative to my component? So I have a the correct uh, um, spatial relationships. And just because this is a pretty large environment, I'm actually completely cheating and saying, you know what, I only want 25% of that movement. So even though that that uh, uh, this laser location may be way off, you know, 100 meters away, I only want it to treat it like it's 25 meters away. That way I'm not super overextending the character mm. that's reaching. Um, so cheat number two, this reach amount, the zero to one, I'm not actually saying reach from where my rest pose is all the way to where my to where echo is. I'm saying only reach 25% of the way um, by, by doing that. So this is creating some bounds that we can art direct without getting into trouble really quickly. I'm trying to make it easy for a designer to come in and tweak values and not feel like they're breaking things really quickly. All right. Now I'm going to dive into my aim with full body IK function. And may look a little scary at first. It's not, I promise. Um, by default, I have a sequence node that's going to do uh, a couple actions. And, and Kieran's already told me that this isn't necessarily uh, necessary, but uh, I think this is habit at this point. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am storing my uh, the transform of my hands from my incoming post, so just my base animation uh, transforms onto some controls. Again, taking data externally and storing it internally so I can see where what things are doing. Um, now, I stored a bunch of controls when I uh, created this control rig, and that's just because I went a little crazy, and I realized I actually am not using most of them. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am actually only using uh, four controls total and striving three bones with my full body IK. I'm feeding in my left and right feet because I want my feet to stay planted, and I'm uh, using my hands control uh, to pull on uh, the the right hand. This is very similar to the setup that I just went through, actually. But instead of pulling on the head, you're pulling on the hand. That's right. Yeah. It's it's a good way to think about it. Uh, what we're doing here, we're pulling on the hand. Like you know, uh, I'm not an animator, so sometimes understanding when these things will move and what will drive them and how to kind of test them, um, yeah. it's a little opaque to me. So thinking about it that way is is helpful. Um, yeah, I think I think Jeremiah is one of the first things you said. Like you drag the hand out. It's like if you think about you're pulling it, watching the body go, you know, as it moves. Like that's the behavior you're going to expect as you drive it with that data. Yeah, and and when I when I created this full body IK initially, I was like, all right, so I need to have both feet. I need my pelvis. I need my chest. I need both my hands, and these are all going to stabilize. 
my character, so I'm re keeping my character motion as true to the initial animation. Um, and I realized I went overboard. I did exactly the opposite of what my advice was earlier. I, I threw everything at it, and I didn't get the result I wanted. I didn't slowly add pieces as, as it was necessary. Um, so let's, I'm going to make, well, no, I need to describe the graphers. Uh, so after I store my uh, bones as some controls, so let's just look really at my hand right. Try and zoom in for you. My right hand and my uh, left and right feet. And then I did one more thing at the end, which is my pelvis. And that's actually relevant because I do tweak my pelvis here at the end. All right, so now that I have my two feet and my right hands, I'm able to perform some actions. Um, my feet, I don't want to do any, any change to my feet. So I'm just going to leave those true to wherever my pose was and feed it directly into my full body IK. Um, my settings are pretty simple. It's just uh, one and one on my offset and strength alphas. And then on the hands, I get a little tricky. It's not too bad, though. Um, all I'm doing is I'm saying where I wish I could. I always draw and, and zoom, so I uh, will draw off my mouse. All right, so wherever Echo is standing, uh, I don't want to move my hands down to the ground. So, like I don't want the hand to actually be on the ground when it reaches convergence of, of where Echo is. I actually want my hand to just move uh, flat. I, I want I want him to or the robot to still be standing upright and not being pulled down. The, the laser's coming out at kind of an angle pointed downwards, right? That's right. right. Yeah. We want to aim the hands down. We don't want to pull the robot down. So all this is doing is saying, keep the height of my hand control, keep the X and Y of the, uh, the laser location. Hopefully Got it. Wasn't terribly that confusing. So that's where that happens. I was poking around looking for that and yep. uh, just to, to play around. And then this is that get reach amount. Here's where I'm piping it in. And all I'm doing, again, is saying, um, do you want to be reaching 100% at this hand control or uh, at my, my uh, initial position, you could think of it? Or do you want it to be 100% at the actor transform or the, the laser location? So this is just interpolate node blending between those two transforms. Got it. Yeah. Once again, I'm being sneaky, and I'm actually remapping this 0 to 1 value to a 0 0.2 value. <laughs> so there's a few of these where I'm just constraining the user so that you're not going to get in trouble. Um, you're going to get a pleasing result no matter how much you crank this. Uh, when we think about creating these types of projects, and if we are going to be doing this as a stage show, uh, and we just said, hey, let's open these things up, start typing in values. We still want to be, you know, fairly uh, getting pleasing results. So that's that's why I do this type of stuff. And this is kind of thinking as a rigger. When I'm rigging characters, I want to make sure that you know if you start yanking on controls, your character is not going to do something completely broken. Um, it's kind of the stuff that Karen was doing, where where he was setting some um, preferred angles and setting some constraints to make sure that the knees aren't bending backwards, that type of stuff. So this is developing with the user in mind. Like I'm not the end user; it's a game designer, an animator, uh, who's my end user. All right. So now I'm doing I'm doing two more things, and then uh, we'll see this in action. One is before I even solve my full body IK, I'm actually shifting the pelvis forward, so that's so that I can lean into the attack, and that's just just a subtle weight shift. The, the pulling on the hand will pull, but it's going to kind of pull and twist your character a little bit. But by shifting the pelvis, I kind of feed the solver a little closer to the result that I would like. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of what Kieran was talking about. By you're informing the solver, hey, here's closer what I want. Here's, here's really what I'm looking for. And then the solver's like, OK, I get it. I'll, I'll kind of clean up those resolve a little bit. Thanks for doing that, Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I should note too that it's important he got the the foot locations before he moved the pelvis because you have right. prop propagate to children checked on, so that would have moved the feet away from where they were animated to be. So yeah, just a 
just a note. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I actually shifted the entire character forward, and then the resolve the feet back to this. Uh, yeah, so that yeah. way only his pelvis leans forward and his feet stay planted. Yeah, if I had this unchecked, then just the pelvis would move forward and the spine would be left behind and the arms, like you'd get some weird stuff. So that's why that's checked. Um, and I'm able to control the, the amount that that is pulling with this ease. This is just, again, doing like, hey, based off of how far away this, uh, the root is from my actor transform, this green is my actor transform. Um, blend in based off of uh, an interpolation curve, which I'm using uh, cubic ease and out for that. Now that I probably confused everybody, um, we'll look at an aim. I know this aim comes up a lot. Uh, so what I'm doing here is after we've resolved everything, this is again, full body IK and motion warping and every other tool that we talk about, those are tools in your toolbox. They're not all magic bullets to resolve everything. So um, in this case, I wanted to be very specific about how my hand was aiming. I wanted it to be you know, <laughs> laser focused on echo. And uh, so I'm doing that myself, not trying to get the solver to get my hand perfect. Um, if you did that, you might get into the place where now your elbows are rotating the way you don't want and your right. shoulders might. So solve the body the way you want and then layer on each individual piece that way you're just fixing one problem at a time, not all the problems in one black box. On, you know, on so that note, on that note, just real quick, would you start from like the the root and then work out like from the pelvis and then make sure your feet aren't moving when the pelvis moves like you want, make sure the upper body's doing what it's supposed to when the pelvis moves, then yeah. get the arm out there where the arm is getting flat, not starting super low, and then you get in the hand. So you're kind of moving from the, the trunk all the way to the leaves. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Broad strokes. Broad strokes, exactly. It's like painting. You're just going like, right. to paint really big broad strokes and slowly add pieces or iterate until Got you it. get the, the pieces. And you know, this is the last thing that I added. Actually, the pelvis, the pelvis ship, what is the last thing I added? That's beside the points. Um, all right, I want to demonstrate this because so far I've just looked at, we've just looked at a bunch of nodes and told you what it's supposed to do. But let's actually do it. Uh, in order to test in this, y'all can follow along. Um, I'm just going to bypass this node. And this node is um, setting the transform of, in fact, you can just right-click and say select regular one, is setting the transform of this actor of control. I don't want the graph to set it. I'm going to manipulate it directly in the viewport. And this is how I was testing my character when I was initially setting up my uh, my rig. I didn't want to have to play the game every time and make sure that my full body mm -hmm. is working. This lets me do it here uh, directly in control. So I think that looks pretty cool. Um, I mean, it's a little boring that it's just standing in a rough pose, but uh, I'm able to test the, the balance effect. Let's just turn off the hierarchy. Look at our character. Cool. Yeah, we just we do cool stuff. Uh, and these red dots represent um, the controls that I was feeding in my initial posts. All right, so now that we have this, let's test it one more way. Um, this is going to represent what happens when I have a full incoming pose in, and then I'm uh, augmenting the pose with control rig. So I can do that by going to previous scenes. I'm going to change my preview controller to a use specific animation, and I'm going to I think it's called Fire, which seems like an appropriate name. There we go. All right. So here, and this is available in uh, early access. We now have the timeline available, so you can actually scrub through this. So I can get to what's my firing reach and tweak some numbers. So here, this is representing where am I firing. And by changing some parameters, like reach amounts. Let's see here. So reach amount is one right now. I can change it to five. Oh, so that's a more natural pose. And I can tweak this really quickly and get an idea of uh, what works best for my character. Mm. And I haven't had to press play once. I'm just doing it live here. Um, 
you leave the and, control point where you want it, and then you start poking things around over there in the details to get it to feel yep. what you think is most natural for that spot. Yeah, and, and this is actually once I, I I did exactly this, and then went into my bone settings. I didn't even tweak bone settings until I mm. was able to test. So now I'm like, well, you know, I don't really like the way the shoulder is working, or uh, I feel like I need more iterations. In fact, I left iterations at the default 20 here. Um, we're going to look at the bone settings real quick, just to give you an idea of uh, what I thought was important, and I'll talk you through my thought process. Uh, these are in complete random order. It was the order that my brain was going through as I was tweaking the character. And so it's actually kind of helpful to see what was my mental process and why did I do the thing I did. Mm. Uh, so spine four, the first thing I wanted is um, the entire upper part of the robot. This whole big chest piece is parented to spine four. And I didn't want that rotating all over the place. I wanted that to be fairly stabilized. So I'm like, you know what, let's, we can chill. Let's not start spinning on me. So I uh, stiffened the rotation significantly, and I, I uh, reduced positional stiffness because I didn't really know what it did. And I thought that made sense. Um, yeah, I can say too, ro rotation <laughs> stiffness of one will actually lock the rotation completely. So I, I, yeah, um, I wanted zero rotation. I wanted yeah, the yeah. clavicles to be doing rotation. Yeah. Unlike so, some other solvers, it's not a suggestion. It will lock it completely. <laughs> <laughs> we mean it, yeah. So yeah, in this case, I didn't want that to rotate at all. I wanted all my rotation to be coming from the core or to be coming from my clavicles and my arm. Uh, so once I got that, it's like, uh, you know what? I I really want the rotation to be going on my clavicle, not so much the upper arm. Um, so I wanted this to pull my shoulder forward, not necessarily for my arm to be rotating forward. So I was like, all right, let's stiffen the upper arm a little bit um, so that it'll it'll push that motion back onto my clavicle. Yeah, it'll favor the surrounding joints. Right. And um, then I, I added some constraints on it just to kind of limit it and keep it in some bounds that I'd like. And again, Remember, all of this motion that's happening is relative to the incoming pose. It's not clamping back to rep pose. It's taking the incoming pose and then tweaking around it. Uh, and then it's like, oh, you know what? I'm completely wrong. <laughs> like, I don't want the clavicle moving at all. That's not what I wanted. So I, I clamped the clavicle. Again, this is this is what's going through my head when I'm trying to build this character. I'm just tweaking my so. This is the mind of a madman. Uh, so I, I fully clamped the clavicle. It's, I didn't like the look because it, the way, since this is a mechanical creature, I don't get the the uh, luxury of deforming my character around a thing. So right. as that clavicle started rotating and the shoulder and the the upper arm started rotating, I was getting clipping in armor that I didn't want. So I was like, you know what, let's back that up. Actually, the pose that our animators created for this firing was spot on. They knew what they're doing. And so I backed away from that as I wanted the motion to air down towards the core and pelvis and the uh, lower arm and wrist. That, so uh, th this is, was really a process of discovery. Um, and if you remember, all I had as inputs were the, the feet and one hand. So that meant that motion could uh, distribute out towards the pelvis and distribute out towards um, the the arm in order to get these these poses. So if I when I started clamping down the pelvis and clamping down my other limbs, it really started distorting the motion. And right. um, I think that's why I created a lot of these constraints is because I was countering all the extra stuff I was feeding in. Once I got rid of a lot of those inputs, it said just these are things I care about. I want you to just add to it. Um, I got much better results. Because I'm, uh, you know, pretty new to animation in general, and not not as knowledgeable as you. Is that because you're clamping down those other places? Uh, that motion has to kind of go somewhere to satisfy that last control point, and so the solver is putting it in the places that are what it feels are most appropriate. And so you're kind of attacking those as you see these other places too to kind of massage it into the appropriate. Result? Yeah, as, as Kieran was saying, it's like, if you think of it like clay, if, if you have a lump of clay that's just like 
all the same consistency and push on it, mm -hmm. it's all going to distribute evenly. But if you have right. some like dried out parts, those parts are just going to. Got it. So similarly, I don't know if that's a good analogy, but uh, same that with the, the bones, the, the stiff we make those bones or, or the heavier, the more mass that we make provide those bones, um, the more it's going to look for somewhere else to, for that motion to go. Um, and we get to, I should say also, when you start increasing stiffness, you'll often have to compensate by increasing iterations if you want to get convergence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and anyone that's worked with springs before as well, you know, the more you increase stiffness, generally, it's not completely true with this, but the more you increase stiffness, the more you're fighting this solver. <laughs> you might get more instability. You might get more. You know, Things right. start going awry. So, uh, one one cool thing that we get with this is, uh, so you can see how the left hand is becoming completely off. That's intentional. Um, I wanted the character to rotate and adjust, so you can see the hand is always aiming at the control, and the body motion is fairly um, restrained. So, you didn't want this easily. This is a huge character. We don't want it moving around like it's it's tight. We really want the hand to be doing a lot of the work, but we just want to inform the rest of the pose. At a very low center of balance or center of gravity. Yes. Yeah. So that's a quick breakdown of this guy. Um, and let's look at what this would look like as a basic IK. That's my basic IK. Uh, it's it's much smaller, um, but it's also doing significantly less. So I can actually, you know, I can just select this and toggle it, and we're going to see. Actually, I probably have a bug in here. Oh, you know what? I'm. Uh, this is why. This is why you put everything on a control and then use the control. I'm actually uh, feeding yeah. the value directly in. Oh, um, right into the yeah, my... node. God, don't do this at home. This is <laughs> <laughs> disappointed in myself. Um, yeah, those controls are nice abstractions. They're, they're really they great really ways are. to kind of isolate yeah. your rig. So I'm just going to get rid of this. I think that's why it's doing that. So now I can tweak directly. So um, you notice that this looks, we're not getting a full pose adjustment. We're not getting right. any weight shift. Um, now, that being said, this solution here is an excellent way to introduce LODing of systems using control rig into your uh, projects. So you can have. Um, once this blueprint is at a certain LOD, toggle this FBIK switch, and now you're using mm. a really cheap solution, still at it, seeing a silhouette change without having the full expense of full body K. Once you get closer, you can switch to a full IK solution and get a much nicer, um, cool. more discrete effect. Really clever, yeah. Uh, okay, now I think we can jump over into Echo, unless if I carry in Chase, or Chance, if you guys want to add anything about this. Um, I could chat I could chat a little bit while you're opening her up. Um, I was just reminded while you were poking around in there, there is a bug I'd like people to be aware of in early access with full body IK. If you lock all three axes, um, it simply ignores the locking settings completely. Um, so I'm aware of it. It's an issue, um, but it won't be for very much longer. So, yeah. You're, yeah if, you, if you're thinking about being clever and locking all three axes instead of setting the rotation stiffness to one, uh, don't don't expect it to work quite yet. So that's that's the way to go about it. Then just stiffness to one would yeah. handle yeah. that for you instead. Cool. Fix this up first. You're supposed to you're supposed to check it in like that. <laughs> so we I, I probably did at one point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, going through this slope warping, which 
is actually misnomer. It's not actually slope warping, um, at least for this example. Uh, we did a full refactor. Uh, Aaron and I actually worked uh, together on this setup. The goal was uh, twofold, I think. One was to use the initial setup that I'd shown before uh, in, in a previous live stream. I think it was this, the February live stream about animating the control rig. Uh, and, and see if we could just hot swap the character and apply it to Echo. Uh, and two was uh, that setup that I showed previously was a pretty destructive setup. It stomped over the leg motion and foot motion and replaced it with solved positions. And so to get around that, I had a toggle of like how fast you're going in. And, um, that being said, there was also a, a cheap version where I solved one position of the root and I rotated the whole uh, foot plane, and so both feet. Uh, so, but that meant that I was solving three times. So that's some context of previous solution. This is a newer solution um, that we used where we're solving twice, we're just solving each foot and tweaking the character uh, slightly differently. Um, also in uh, classic production, I left all my old stuff in here on accident. So if you want to read my work, uh, it's a great way to do it. Uh, this is all of this is actually um, created between a Zoom call between Aaron and I. Um, this was our thought process going to whole th through the whole thing, and then we broke it out into functions and sequences. So um, very nice. You want to, then we you left it see? there deliberately for reference it's for the future, deliberately. Right, Jeremiah. That's right. This was um, we were thinking about. Uh, this live stream and how we're going to talk through it and uh, <laughs> yeah, months and months ago like incredible like, foresight someday <laughs> yeah so you're uh, welcome yeah you're welcome <laughs> so if you open this up and you're confused it's for your benefit <laughs> okay so i'm going to talk through the high level of how this works and then we'll eventually get to how is full body k involved in all of this um what we're doing is uh, we are tracing both feet. We're seeing what foot is lowest, and we're moving our entire character from the pelvis down, um, breaking one of Kieran's rules of never pull your character out of the capsule. We're probably going to yank the character out of the capsule uh, if you're on a really high step. Uh, that being said, you can see how what the maximum amount of moving that character out is uh, through these debug uh, squares here. So we're tracing about the height of her knee up and the height of your knee down below the foot. So uh, by doing this, by, tr by um, moving the entire character down to the lowest foot, we only need to compensate one foot up rather than both feet up and down. Uh, so that's a change in, uh, between the two approaches. Um, once we have that adjustment and we are able to we tweak the pelvis down, we adjust our feet into position with the full body okay, um, uh, onto IK foot bones. Um, we figure out the uh, hit normals of our feet, and then we apply all that data into the full IK. So once again, the, the thing I've said before, I'll say it again and again and again, is gather all your data first, put it on controls or on bones so you can visualize it, and then do something with it. If you try and feed all your data right into a solver and it goes all crazy, you'll have no idea why. You're just looking at you know, vectors and transform. You know, you'll be watching and looking at matrices and it's gonna be confusing. So all of this stuff here is just gathering our data, getting it into a structure that we really um, can compartmentalize and understand before we apply anything. So at the end, when we're applying it, we're just doing a very simple process and are able to say, ah, okay, so now my pelvis is here. I'm taking the solved solutions from my IK left and right feet, very similar to um, our robot. And then um, again, using a stabilizer, I'm using the chest to stabilize rather than the head. Um, and this is a very similar setup to what Kieran showed. Uh, I, I only used three bone settings on this, uh, which is kind of crazy. Those who are that watching, 
Um, this, this he means stabilizer because of the strength alpha is zero. So there's nothing right. driving that that effector towards its location. It's just by by including it, those bones are now part of the solve and they have to be pulled with the the feet. So they'll they'll have some st stability. That's right. Yeah. All right. Um, these are just drawing transforms. That's actually so we can visualize. That's these uh, foot transforms. You can see right there. Uh, again, not because I was lazy, but because we were working really hard and trying to do a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, I left in the pull vector stuff from the previous setup. We're not using those. Um, it's not necessary with this setup, but it's a leftover from the previous local things. OK, so. Do we, uh, sorry, just do we control the direction of the knees with um, preferred angles now? Or I yeah. think we are only doing the preferred angles. Yeah. OK, cool. So that's it. Um, so having said, um, this solver gave me the results I was looking for in this specific scenario. And uh, we really like what the knees were doing. Um, that doesn't mean that this is always going to solve every pullback or solution that you may require. Maybe if you want to make sure that maybe you're climbing something and you want to move and splay the knees out so that they're not penetrating a rock or something, you may want to solve that specifically. Um, but this scenario doesn't call for it, and so I chose not to use it. In fact, that's a great way to think about things is rather than making these massive monolithic graphs that try and solve everything, solve right. the thing you care about, and then um, maybe make a different solution to solve the specific climbing scenario. You don't, it doesn't need to do everything all the time. But you'll have a slower system, you'll introduce more errors, and you're going to be pulling your hair out at, you know, at the ninth hour when you're trying to ship the game. Similar to what you said about um, the LODs for the robot, right? If you could pass, or the ancient, if you could pass data into this to switch between those modes based on your player state, uh, your animation blueprint, other things that are you're already switching between, that seems like a really easy um, point to kind of key off of to to take those different scenarios into action. Yeah, you can you can absolutely do it that way. Um, or there's no reason why you can't have multiple control rigs that say, you know what? Oh have yeah, to, you know, just do it in your blueprint. Say this is my running around control rig, and this is my climbing control rig, and um, do it here and. Uh, and the ambient yeah. We're really starting to think of control rigs as these transient little bits of behavior that yeah. you can kind of plug in wherever you need. No, yeah. that's much more elegant because then you don't have any file contention if someone's working on one of them and you have somebody else working on another. That's great. Yep. Thank you for clarifying. All right. So I'm going to dive into how we solve this. The, the full body K approach is actually. And the, the amount of work that this thing is doing is um, it's obviously adjusting the pose, but it's just feeding off of a couple of parameters. And you can see it's not very complex. It was really ensuring that the data we're feeding in is good data that and, and informing the solver of what we really cared about and what we don't care about. That was more important than the solver itself. Um, not to say here that your solver is. <laughs> Not important. But that is exactly how it's intended to be used. Yeah. Yeah. It's this is supposed to be used as part of the tool, not the whole tool. You you work up front and make sure that you're processing your data well, you'll um, have a much happier time. So how are we getting all this data? This may look familiar. Um, I'm just storing my uh, my incoming pose as uh, rather than controls, I'm actually using IK bones. These IK bones, very similar to controls, are uh, IK, or not IK, uh, control rate bones that I created here. You can just right click and say new bone, name it something relevant. These bones, by the way, only exist in this control rig. Um, they do not exist on the skeleton itself, so you can't use it, cannot use it for animation blending um, outside of this system. Um, in this case, uh, this is the only place that I, I wanted to use it. All right, so um, I'm storing my incoming animation on these uh, bones, these nodes. I'm storing my spine three onto my chest. 
and I'm storing my pelvis bone onto my body control. This is pretty important. It's all important, but this is most important because it's making sure that um, the animation of the body sway and the hip sway is all coming through. And then the only way that I'm offsetting my pelvis is by adjusting this pelvis control, which is a child uh, in uh, ZX, well, world ZX vocal. Mm. Um, so it's just an offset. I'm only tweaking um, what's the, what the animator's already done. I'm not stamping over um, any of the work. And that's something that's really important when we talk about this type of work um, is maintaining animator intents. Um, they're very good at what they do. They spend a lot of time at doing what they do. Our role here is not to recreate it and re reinvent it. It's to enhance it. I, I know I've already said that, but it, it's really important. All right, so um, great. So now we've stored all our data as controls. We have everything, all the data we need in Control Rig. Now we're going to start running a couple of traces. We uh, are going to use uh, Control Rig functions for the first time here. Uh, to process the foot. Processing the foot is really just um, getting, where is that? I don't remember what that is. <laughs> remember back six months. Um, oh, OK. So uh, what we're doing is we're actually storing our hit normal so we can have a delta of what our previous normal was. I think that's, that's what this oh, is okay. doing. Um, so when we go into this trace, by the way, uh, tangent again, Aaron made these gorgeous graphs. So if you guys want to make desktop backgrounds or something of these, or turn them into like, uh, you know, Metro, uh, sort of modern maps, art. <laughs> I highly recommend it. If there's any like, uh, city <laughs> workers out there who are looking for their Metro system to be designed, uh, yeah. Your guys. yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to pass in our IK uh, foot bone. And now we're going to be doing all of our work on that IK foot bone. Uh, we're not modifying our skeleton. We're not, you know, our base skeleton. We're not modifying our full IK. We're going to be processing these controls. And we're passing that in right here so we can change out whether it's the left foot or the right foot. Uh, we are measuring above and below our um, hit points. So in this case, we're doing the, the heel. You could easily do the toe, but in this case, we just did the heel because the toe introduces some um, edge cases we didn't want to handle. And we're passing those in as our start and end. And then uh, if we actually hit something, we're going to do something. If we don't, we're going to ignore it. Uh, hey, a lot question. of the stuff. Yeah. Uh, sorry, about the uh, sphere trace, how do you filter the, the collision that you're actually trying to touch? In this case, we're doing um, any traceable object, which is being defined by, um, we did that on the environment side, uh, say, basically saying nothing can be traced against except for a few things. Mm -hmm. But okay. in, this, in this case, and this is actually, I think, new to uh, fiberly access, we have sphere trace of types. So here we can do by object types and introduce. Uh, oh, there it any, is. Yeah. yeah any object type. I think we also have um, sphere trace by channel mm -hmm. if you want to choose a specific trace channel. Um, but rather than defining it here, we're, we let the uh, let that be defined in the environment. So let me get rid of this guy. All right. Now, uh, what we care about this uh, in here is, did we hit something? Um, and if we did, where did we hit? And um, what was the normal? Um, a lot of these lines, by the way, is dealing with drawing transforms. We're ensuring that we're watching every time to, to see um, what we're hitting and if we'd like the vector coming out. I think that's very important for developing something like this. Um where you're, you're going to run into a lot of pitfalls and being able to visualize that instantly just really helps while you're making your control rig. Yeah. Um, I, I am not brave enough to do this live and set this up with nodes. So that's why we're crawling through this big graph. Um, 
and, and something to this is one more node that's doing a lot of the work. We're actually using Spring Interpolate, which is new to uh, the Spring Interpolate is new to Control Rig and Five Early Access. And this allows us to say if there's a large delta between our previous surface normal and our current surface normal, then we're going to blend between that faster. If there's a small delta, you won't um, you won't need to interpolate as quickly, or the, the interpolation will happen. With uh, the, the stiffness won't be as strong, so we'll be pulling as hard. If we just use a, a regular uh, interpolate value, it'd still work, but we wouldn't like when you're going upstairs. You want to be able to pull the foot up quickly if it's a big step, or just kind of interpolate slowly if it's a small step. Yeah, this started from Jeremiah complaining that things felt mushy um, with just regular interpolation. Because if you start getting big deltas, you can't prevent that because the player can be, like Jeremiah said, running upstairs. And yeah. um, without a spring, you just start getting really mushy motion um, mm. with a regular interpolate. And then um, again, more debug. So all we're doing here is saying, now that I know what normal is, Let's scale it up so we can see it. So when you're running around the world, you're going to see this big line um, going around. So now at the end, we've gathered what's our new normal, what's our target offset, so how far did our foot move up or down, and uh, we're returning that value. And we're returning, did we even hit anything at all? So if we look at this uh, output, we've gathered now a couple of variables. Um, I, I want to highlight now again the way that we've gathered this data. We're gathering it in compartmentalized, easily debuggable sections. So we broke um, reusable content into a function, and we're storing the outputs as variables. We could just as easily have strung these lines across the graph, but when you think about debugging, when you think about that ninth hour production and, and you're trying to figure out why the heck is this happening? Um, this is so much easier to debug than stretching your lines everywhere. Um, right. it, it comes down to sustainable development. Okay, um, we did that twice. We reached, we traced both of our feet. Now we know where they're supposed to hit and um, and oh, what they're supposed to be aiming. We still haven't made any changes to the skeleton. Now we're going to solve for the pelvis. So since we know our um, both our right and left foot offsets, we're going to find which one is slower, and we're just going to offset the pelvis by that much. Um, as part of this, we've stored what's our current pelvis offset, uh, and that's going to allow us um, to feed that into that spring interp. Again, same thing as the foot. If our character goes up really quickly, we want to be able to pull our pelvis, our pelvis up quickly. Um, and vice versa. Uh, since we have um, per interpolate values for the pelvis and the feet, we can fine tune how quickly the pelvis interpolates versus how quickly the feet. You may want the feet to pull up really quickly, but the pelvis right. to have a lot of weight to it. Um, right. If you think of like an ostrich or something where the, the feet are snapping up really quickly, <laughs> but the, uh, it has this, <laughs> quite a bit of mass on top. The thing almost everyone runs into when they try to make a system like this is it starts looking good and then they run upstairs and the character's just jittering like crazy. Um, this and, is the magic. Uh, yeah, and so they try to add an interpolation, but then the character starts like lagging down in the stairs mm -hmm. um, or floating in the air too much um, when you're going downstairs. And so this is where this, uh, this spring comes in. What I'm hearing is if you're going to try to employ this, start testing on stairs very fast. Yes. Uh, that was the, the very first thing we tested. We did yeah. uh, running on stairs and running on spheres, big spheres. Oh, so, right. Yeah, cool. Uh, I press play, so we're just going to sit and watch this for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I want to show you is, again, we've just been looking at, um, at a graph, but once we see her walking around, it'll all kind of uh, makes sense. There we go. Let's see uh, what we can do with some motion. Actually. 
Nice. I like it. That was Notice you saw some sliding because you're not at 16.9, which is what we tuned it to. That's so true. It yeah. Be so <laughs> <slidey. Camera. laughs> That's right, because we changed this to the uh, open ratio. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You monster. <laughs> All right. So seeing this in action, um, I see your feet doing. There we go. Her feet are automatically adjusting. That's cool. Um, in Katorig now, I can uh, go and, and select her her character in, uh, in the debug preview and see what's happening in control rig. So I, I have this debug information available here. Super useful. Yeah. Awesome. Um, but also new in um, five early access uh, is you're able to see that control rig debug information in Pi. Um, now in the Valley of the Ancient Project, that's hot key to just the number nine on the, the top room. Uh, but it's also available in the console. Actually, it's here. I think it's in dot in the mode control rig debug one. Turn it on. So um, the reason we saw the skeleton and the uh, control rig debug is because we're actually turning on both show bones and the control rig debug just to let's see. So let's go back and turn this back on. So what you can see are the um, orientation of the bone itself um, that I'm solving to. You can see the height that my character is tracing up to and down to, and the adjustment of my character obviously happening. Uh, when you look at the control rig, you can see clearly how the yellow uh, body control is, salt is just taking in my animation input. And then this blue circle is doing the pelvis offset. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see how all my hip motion is still carried through. It's just an additive process. We'll go up to uh, my favorite rock here. <laughs> and um, you can kind of get a full uh, demonstration of what she's doing. That rock was a project favorite for yes. very many months. <laughs> good, so, good kind of extreme case for us to test a lot of this stuff out yeah. while we're working on it. And you can see these white lines, I think, are representing the normal of the geometry we're tracing. So quickly, we were able to see what angle does the solver think my feet should be oriented at? What is the normal of the geometry I'm tracing against? And how high and how uh, low am I tracing? So just to uh, reiterate the, the debugging process of this when you're working with real world stuff, um, or I guess digital world stuff, um, being able to see all the information that's being fed into the solver really quickly is pretty critical to getting the results you care about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love it. I always love having this, this view up. That view is great. When you showed yeah. me that, like super late in the project, because again, I'm I'm pretty new Slide to a lot on. of these features. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's actually really awesome that you can not just debug it inside your inside your view, view level viewport, but almost like a blueprint or anything, you can actually watch it in real time taking place. Yeah. Um, kind of an isolation, which is super, super nice. I can also start tweaking things live here. Um, so I think I just turned off my all this offset. I think. What did I do? Yeah, so uh, there I turned off the pelvis offset. The pelvis was actually what was shifting the whole character down. So mm -hmm. even though um, you can see the green here is where it's tracing against the ground, my foot isn't able to reach that uh, because my pelvis wasn't pulled down. I see. Um, so being able to test that stuff live in a controller preview like this um, gives you a lot of control um, to refine your solution, refine the data that's going into your solver. So did you see how quickly um, the foot blended up and down? Um, that's the spring interpolate um, doing the work there. Um, also, I want to highlight that as she's walking walking down, it's a little easier to see. And it's not great. 
see, let's see if I do this. Bottom row two. Oh, we still have the full foot roll happening on top of as we're slope warping, and that's because all the foot adjustment again is additive rather than replacing. Whereas in my original solution, it was just stomping over that foot roll and kind of snapping the feet. Mm. So, um, and that I have to give full props to Aaron for uh, making that doable. All right, press escape. Let's see what happens. Um, all right. That's great. Uh, definitely recommend looking at this. I know that this can look a little confusing since we have the functions and it has all the debug information built in. Um, but uh, this process at the top, if you want to look at the this version, this is essentially what we're doing with a few refinements um, and better debugging. I think that's right. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning, like this is just sort of the start of a system like this. Like we we made this so people can see how we're doing it with control rig and yeah, um, sort of get you started. But you know, there's so much more we could build on this to keep improving the quality. That's right. And there's there's so much more. Kind of to to take this back um, to full by AK and a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, we're we're trying to take this type of behavior and make it so you don't have to build these large graphs. And you absolutely can, and you can have that fine control if you would like. Um, but with a lot of the work that we're doing, both on um, the gameplay animation team and the full body IK teams, um, we're looking at ways to feed these uh, this gameplay data into higher level um, uh, anim nodes and, and components so that uh, you can get this control very quickly. So this is. We're really happy with the, the stuff we've been able to do here and um, and five early access, but I can't wait to show you more stuff that we're working on as we move towards five. Oh, this is awesome. Thanks for walking us through all that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, but honestly, it's... kudos to the dev team for making it all possible. Yeah, for sure. Very cool stuff. Um, I think I'm, I'm not out of breath, but I'm done talking about this. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd love to open it up for any questions for this or for anything else. I know we didn't do specifically full body IK questions. Um, so give Kieran a chance to answer some that may have come through. We will. But before that, we're going to take a break because we're going on two hours and 20 minutes here. And I know some folks need a little bit of break. So uh, everyone, bear with us. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes.
All right, we are back from our quick break. Everyone's feeling much better. And we can go ahead and dive into some uh, couple of questions. Let's start off with some of the full body IK ones that we received, and then we'll go into control rig and uh, some of the other ones a little bit more in general. Um, first question in this section of the Q&A comes from Prismane, who's wondering, does the full body IK solver only work for human characters? No, it works. It's completely skeleton agnostic. It'll work for any character you throw at it. It, it as with um, all skeletal meshes in, in uh, UE, though, you do need a single hierarchy or a connected hierarchy. There's a follow up to that. Uh, can these characters have a tail? And I would say yes. Uh, have a tail we just chose it. It wasn't quite right for this project. Yeah, the, the ancient's tail, we, we cut it. It was too costly. I would add to that we have content samples um, in the works that include spiders, quadrupeds, bipeds, tripods, um, all kinds of things, things with tails. Um, so yeah, by all means, it's uh, awesome. anybody. Another one on that topic is, does FBIK only work with control characters slash characters on the epic skeleton? Uh, again, to reiterate that if by epic skeleton you mean the mannequin skeleton, you know, it'll work on any skeleton these robot. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we test on is we just pull stuff in the marketplace and, and see what the, the uh, solver does on it. Um, so yeah. uh, what was the other question? Is a two-parter. Oh, no, that's basically it. Yeah, that was it. OK. OK. You got it. Um, another question is from Nana Kontov, who's wondering, uh, look at IK nodes are often basic and rotate head, neck, spine to face the target without taking into effect whether these rotations can be achieved in real life. Can you combine full body IK with look at IK to achieve a realistic look so that the body will twist, contort to achieve the final direction based on real life rotation limits? Uh, again, yes. Um, I think I think the robot was a great example of that. Rather than using the head to look at something, we're using the arm to look at something. But we're still solving what a natural pose would look like for that specific look. Um, you could just as easily target head or a chest and kind of pull and guide things. It's all about providing the good, good data in. Karen, you want to add? Hello. Um, I, I would add to that. Yeah, you you can definitely get some look at behaviors set up with what we have now. Um, I think there's a space for future development where we concentrate on that problem in particular. Um, there's some things about it that could use some custom attention, um, but certainly the approach that we have here will be what we use going forward for look at technology so that you can get that behavior that you're looking for where things don't um, rotate too far. And essentially you want those those rotation limits to keep keep the puppet in the space of anatomical um, correctness. Yeah. And, and when it comes but, to look at stuff, it's uh, that tends to be very skeleton or character specific. You know, what a look at looks like for a, a dog is not going to be the same as what it looks like for a person. And you can set up those constraints and tweak them and test them in that viewer, right, to make sure it's doing what you want. But very similar to what you were doing with the arm, right? So, yeah. Cool. Um, I've got one here. This is really super high level, so I, I won't. It's, it's a very general question, but. Um, we don't really need details. What are the performance costs of FBIK in general? So I, I assume that everything comes at a cost, right? And I know we'll be making trade-offs, but like, are there relative costs you could say or times you want to say, hey, be sparingly do this or that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the performance characteristics work like this. You, you basically take um, all the bones that are between your effectors and the, pelvi uh, the, the root bone that you've assigned, usually the pelvis, and that's the number of bones that the solver actually considers in the inner loops when it's doing its constraint solving. So you take that number, say it's 30, and you multiply it by the number of iterations. So your your performance is going to be proportional to that that number there. Got it. Um, that said, the iterations are really quite cheap. And in practice, the full body IK doesn't really show up on the profiler as something that you have to worry about. That's not to say that you couldn't crank the iterations up until it is something you have to worry about, yeah. but um, so far, so good. Every system can be abused, right? Well, that's good to hear. Um, similar to how we're piping data into other pieces of uh, 
you know, via control rig or the FBIK node. Are there plans to be able to like ramp things like stiffness value um, based on data, or is that something that's kind of fixed? That's a great question. In control rig, I, everything's exposed. So the awesome. only thing that you can't change is the bones that you're targeting for your effectors or the root bone. And in other okay. words, not, no, no like sw swapping a goal that's pulling the right yeah. hand to now pulling the left hand. Right. You could probably solve that if you had to with a separate control rig, though, right? Exactly. Like and those. then you'd blend between a separate solve if you yeah. wanted to get that. And the, and the animation blueprint would... Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. We have another one. Um, so just to finalize to answer some performance, but Luch Labs was wondering, are there any performance considerations to keep in mind with the number of control points in these IK rigs? Controls, uh, like the Wait, controls the in, the, in, the, in a control rig in general? Is that what they're getting at? Or the number of, I, I'm assuming it's, and I would answer as the number of um, control effectors or goals that you're feeding into it. So if you have just the two feet in the hand versus. Right, the whole body. The whole body. <laughs> yeah, then again, you're going to have more bones that are between effectors and your root, and thus more bones that are being considered as part of the constraint solve. And so, yeah, more, more effectors will increase the performance cost. I think that's a good explanation, right? The more bones, the higher the performance cost of computing what those are supposed to do. Yep. Yeah. But uh, it's a Kieran's, linear relationship. Yeah. Kieran's kind of making the connection between if you think of a just your classic uh, uh, stick man, you know, if you if you draw a line from the right foot and the left foot and the right hand, you're never going to touch the left arm. And so therefore the left arm is not part of that cost. Right. Uh, but if you, so you kind of connect the dots between your effector through the skeleton and that is the number of bones that's included yeah. in that cost. Go, go up the hierarchy from parent to parent to parent until you hit the, the one that you've specified as the root. And those are all the bones that are going to be solved. Yep. Awesome. Uh, we, we are looking at um, being able to improve that even further. And Karen had referenced some uh, performance enhancements that we're already working on as we continue to develop the solver. Uh, so that may change in the future, but we're already pretty happy with uh, the, the speed of the solver. One of the questions we received on the forums came from Inside, who uh, had been looking at the motion matching and post matching um, code that exists in the engine. Do, do we have anything to share um, in regards to those? We don't currently have anything to share around the pose and motion matching. Um, that stuff is currently in development, and we'll be able to talk about more of it uh, later as we get closer to five. On that note, there was another question here from TorinX99, who's wondering um, about more documentation. And just wanted to reiterate that most of these tools are still heavy in development, and uh, more documentation on real online learning resources and more uh, videos on how to use them are things we are planning for, for the future when the tools are um, sort of ready for prime time. Yeah. I do want to add on to that that the documentation de team did an incredible job of documenting the majority of the early access features. And you can find all of that stuff on our documentation. In particular, there are documents on the full body IK node as it stands in early access and uh, motion warping. Um, and if you take a look at the ancient one, you know what? I am, we can show my screen really quick. I uh, just want to show some of this documentation. So Good, Jeremiah. Uh, in contents and samples, there's the value of the ancient sample. If you haven't taken a look at this doc, it's incredible. Um, I'm, I'm blown away by what our docs team was able to do and how detailed yeah. they were able to go into this. Um, if you do get uh, uh, get here and scroll down into uh, flexible real-time animation, we are going to just look at all the images already. <laughs> um, this is a breakdown of motion warping. This is a high level of what Aaron talked about uh, with great descriptions of um, how it's set up in the project. Um, we go through some control rig improvements and the full body IK solver. This is all very high level about how it's implemented for this project specifically. But there are also docs um, in our 
early access documentation that goes over the new full AIK solver, including all the parameters and how to set it up, and the motion warping, including the parameters and how to set it up. So if you want to get to this really quickly and not you know, rewatch the three hour video here, it's a great place to start. Um, definitely something we should uh, continue to share. Our docs team did an amazing job. Thanks, Jeremiah. It's a good, good note that there is actually documentation on some of the unfinished features already. And Jeremiah, I think you touched on it earlier too, um, but we have one question from the chat today was about keeping parity between control rig, new control rig features, 426, 427. Um, pretty much everything we've talked about specifically today and kind of going forward, they're gonna be UE5 features, is that correct? Yeah, everything we're talking about here is going to be uh, UE5 features. Uh, you can bring your uh, UE4 projects into UE5, but a lot of the stuff we're showing today is not expected to be uh, backward portable into UE4. Right. We received a few questions in regards to um, generic, I'm a layman. So uh, animation warping is what the real John here is describing it as, but um, a few of the other questions were in regards to um, doing animations for different sized characters that all have the same skeleton. So a really big guy, you know, with the same skeleton as like a skinny guy. And if there are any plans and work towards um, making our procedural animations be able to be aware of the size of the uh, characters themselves. I'm going to touch on it first, and then I'm going to pass it to Kieran and Aaron, who both probably have something to contribute to it. Uh, so. In five, we're doing, uh, we're really looking hard at uh, the solvers and the underlying systems for retargeting. The, again, this full by AK solver that we're um, writing or that we've written so far is the first step of that. And we're working on a whole bunch of other things to make retargeting easier. Um, and that includes both retargeting offline and runtime. Um, this is going to be hopefully a substantial improvement from what we're. Um, and much more controllable from what we're seeing in UE4. And that will handle those types of proportion changes and dr dramatic proportion changes um, that you may encounter. Uh, so yes, absolutely. But um, there's much more to consider there. And I think that the person who asked this touched on it on the way that the motion is warps. And it's, you know, the solver's not going to do everything. So, but I'll pass it over to Kieran and then Aaron. Uh, I would just add to that that one of the beautiful things about control rig is that it's skeleton agnostic to, to a large degree. So um, provided you haven't hard coded values in there or anything specific to a skeleton, you can apply the same control rig to skeletons of different proportions. And there's nothing about the full body IK node that assumes the proportions that it was created with. So when you when it's initialized, if it's initialized on a ogre and it was um, you know set up on a on a dwarf, it'll it'll work just fine. Um, again, assuming you haven't hard coded any any values in there that would cause it to otherwise not work. Aaron, anything to add? Um, yeah, I'll just say that um, it's definitely important to us to be able to um, support characters of different dimensions. Um, certainly, uh, that applies to any any uh, internal projects we've had. And uh, uh, yeah, it's it's on our minds. It's something we have active work on. But uh, like some of these other things, we don't really have anything to uh, to show just yet for early access. I think I'm trying to find the couple left here, and I know we're running really tight on time. Um, so I'll give uh, just for those that may be new to UE5 or some of these concepts. Uh, I, th I think I know the answer to this one, but Jeremiah, I'll pass this your way. From Val uh, Valen3, for the animation tools, can we create entire animations from scratch, or will, will we still need a base animation and then adjust to using these tools? You absolutely can create animation from scratch. Two notes on that. We did an awesome live stream uh, back in February where we talk about animating an engine. Um, and that showcases all that functionality in uh, 426. Highly recommend going and taking a look at it. It's another long stream, but um, uh, the community team, I, I sorry, I don't know who does it, but they bookmarked all the sections. If you go on YouTube and you want to jump right to the parts you care about, there's some animating and engine stuff there. Second point is the Valley of the Ancient project specifically. We 
um, animated all animation for the robot 100 percent in engine um, that includes both the cinematics and the gameplay animation so yes it's possible you can see the results if you download this project and take a look at it. Shout out to Sky Russell, who does all of the timestamps on all of the Inside Unreal videos, and who's also the person helping us capture questions in chat. So big shout out. Cool. Yeah, I, I think with that, it's it's almost it's time to wrap up here. Looking, there's a lot of generic questions. Uh, most of them we have already sort of covered in one, two, or three topics. Um, to today and so with that i think it's time to wrap up this has been great guys um, absolutely yeah appreciate y'all coming on and jeremiah i know you do long streams but you know what there's a lot of information to share and so we appreciate you uh sticking around and actually sharing all of that you know a lot of this is tribal knowledge right this is comes straight from the people who are working with it so it's important to get it out and i know that people appreciate it so thank you that was a lot of fun thank thanks you. guys thanks yeah, for thanks everyone for having us for you're Thanks gonna... for staying on so long and watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, um, if you have been watching from the beginning, thank you very much for hanging out. If you haven't, also big thank you. It doesn't really matter. You can always watch the VODs on both YouTube and Twitch afterwards, uh, immediately as soon as we go offline. Um, Jeremiah already mentioned it, but we do timestamp the videos, usually within the seven-day range, and that's also when you can find the uh, full manually authored captions that we upload as a transcript on the YouTube side of things. It can be useful uh, for you to find you know, how to spell some terminology that was discussed. If you're new to some of these concepts, go Google it, read some white papers or whatnot. Uh, Kieran pointed, pointed to some when it came to uh, IK earlier, and that's where a lot of these features and tools comes from initially. It's some really smart people uh, that doesn't spend their Thursdays um, hanging out on Twitch. <laughs> Maybe so. I, I, have one of you guys written a white paper? Uh, no, actually, I've, I'm not published uh, in any academic way. All right, so not on Twitch then. Uh, <laughs> if you are excited about Unreal Engine and you haven't got started with it yet, you can download it straight from the Epic Games launcher and go to unrealengine.com if you don't have that already. And you can just go, it's free, free to use. Um, and there's a lot of learning resources out there. And something I'd like to reiterate is that even though we have released early access uh, for Unreal Engine 5, many, many, most of all the concepts that you can learn in all of our content for UE4 still apply to Unreal Engine 5. And so there's no uh, sort of bad time to get started on how to learn. Um, you know, there's like 160 hours of content, I think, on learn.unrealengine.com. Great place to get started. Uh, the forums are also a good place to find people trying to solve problems or just find trying to find others who are working on similar projects. Um, and my camera likes to do this sometimes. <laughs> it's just what it does. It's been doing this for a year and a half now. Three hours. Yeah, it's just my setup. I tried two separate computers. It's, it's still the same thing happening over and over again. Uh, that said, we are still looking for all the amazing projects that you guys are working out, uh, working on out there. So make sure you share them with us, Twitter, Facebook, the forums, unrealcyclers.org, uh, which is our unofficial Discord community, are all great places to get in touch with us and share what you're working on. It's always exciting, and you might become one of our community spotlights that we put on the show every week. Um, if you stream on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine tag combined with whichever one uh, other one is uh, correct for you. Game development, creative, there's software development now, I think, as well, um, which is a good way for folks to find your content by using the filtering options. Um, and make sure you follow us on social media, and that includes hitting the notification bell on YouTube, which is where you will get a notification when we go live, because if you don't know, we're live on both YouTube and Twitch. Um, next week, we are not going to be doing another live stream because Epic is actually going on a two-week summer break. And so, uh, you know, let us rest <laughs> after this long U5 uh, project, uh, Valley of the Ancient, and all the live streams, and we'll be back with more content. We got um, Meta Sounds and Quartz. We'll be covering game feature plugins as well as Mega Assemblies. Thank you. Aaron Langmead is coming out to cover Mega Assemblies. Thank you, Chance. That's why you're here. That's um, why it's, yeah, it's the value I add is to add, have the facts for you, Victor. <laughs> There's a lot more than that. Um, once again, thanks to Aaron, Jeremiah, and Kieran all for coming on chat. Please give yes. it up um, for them coming on. I'm sure we, or hopefully, we will get to see you all in the future, maybe when we get to dive into a little bit more control rig stuff. Um, Yes, Jeremiah is not. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll say also, you know, I see a bunch of Twitter handles here. So if you're working on something with um, FBI K or Control Rig, Motion Warping, any of these new features in early access, 
um, show the the, the uh, show the engine Twitter, show these folks what you're working on. Uh, you know, we're always excited to see what the community is doing, what problems they're trying to solve and successfully solving, and ways that they're surprising us um, by using these tools. So we're uh, really looking forward to seeing what you do with the tech. And if you're unsuccessful in solving those. We want to see that as well. So we can <laughs> just do it in a private message. If <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all. And thanks to all, you all out there. We hope you're staying safe. And uh, we will see you again in two, two weeks. One, two, three weeks. That's how math three works. <laughs> cool. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks.